And now we take you live to the Rayburn House Office Building on Capitol Hill for a hearing on the nature of the drug flow from Columbia and U.S. efforts to block it. A House Government Reform Subcommittee will hear from officials with the state and defense departments from National Drug Control Policy Director Barry McCaffrey and others.
Good morning. I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources to order. Uh, the subject of the hearing uh, this morning is the narcotics uh, threat from Colombia. Um, as our regular order, I would like to uh, start with an opening statement and then yield uh, to uh, those members that are with us. We'll be joined by some other members, but we want to get started because we have uh, uh, several panels to hear from today. <clears throat> this is a, a very important hearing since uh, our hemisphere in the United States are facing one of the greatest challenges to regional and national security as the situation with Colombia continues to deteriorate. During the past few days, the United States military lost five American lives in the war on drug being waged in Colombia. The influx of illegal drugs to the United States is our nation's number one social challenge and the most insidious uh, national threat we have faced. Because three quarters of the heroin on the United States street and virtually all of the cocaine comes from Colombia today, this subcommittee is once again investigating and conducting oversight of our, uh, our administration's counter drug activities in Colombia. For the record, I've been to Colombia several times over the past few years and, uh, and many years ago, um, and most recently in February. I have seen firsthand the enormity and complexity of the drug insurgency problem there. Even since February, the threat has grown substantially. Events uh, in, in country appear to be spiraling out of control. Colombia is now what military officials call situation critical. Many of us on the Hill saw the situation coming years ago as this administration repeatedly ignored the problem. As a result, Colombia now supplies 80% of the cocaine entering the United States. More disturbing in just the past five years than there's been an absolute explosion of poppy cultivation in Colombia. High purity Colombian heroin in tremendous quantities is now flooding our communities. Heroin overdoses have doubled in the past uh, two years, and that's a uh, uh, those ending in fatalities. Since 1992, heroin use by our teenagers has soared 825 percent. Our DEA heroin signature program indicates that 75 percent of the heroin seized in the United States uh, originates in Colombia. This uh, chart was provided to us by, by Tom Carr. 
Constantine, the former DEA director, shows 1997, 75% of the heroin now uh, coming uh, from South America. If you took this chart several years ago, it would be almost uh, zero. Most of it would be coming in from uh, Southwest Asia, Asia uh, or Mexico. Uh, it wasn't even on the charts. Um, cocaine uh, was merely uh, processed in Colombia some five, six years ago. Uh, now it is the, uh, Colombia is the major producer of cocaine uh, in the world. Compounding the uh, problem, Colombia faces a full-scale guerrilla war, one that is financed almost entirely by narcotics trafficking. By recent accounts, the armed conflict is now raging out of control in Colombia. Rebel insurgents are becoming more and more aggressive and killing people indiscriminately. In fact, more people have been displaced in Colombia than in Kosovo, even at the height of the recent conflict, and there are indications of a potential mass exodus from Colombia. More than 300,000 Colombians were internally displaced just in 1998 compared to 230 in Kosovo during that same period of time. In short, despite five years of congressional pleas uh, for assistance to Colombia, countless hearings and intense congressional effort, resources approved by Congress have failed to be provided to Colombia. Two weeks ago today, five American men and and uh, one, including one woman from the United States Army, uh, were, were killed in the line of duty in Colombia when their U.S. reconnaissance plane crashed into a mountain on a, a counter nug, drug uh, mission into uh, narco guerrilla territory. This marks the first time in United States history that American military personnel have been killed in action in Colombia's drug war. American blood has also been spilled on Colombian soil in other ways. In addition to these five Americans, three contract pilots have been killed in Colombia over the past two years. Three Americans were abducted and brutally murdered by the FARC and still not brought to justice, and we'll show some tape in a few minutes uh, that really raises questions about why the, the uh, murders of these Americans haven't been captured but they were killed by Colombia's largest group of drug trafficking uh, guerrillas earlier this year. And numerous Americans have been kidnapped by Colombian narco guerrillas. The longest held United States hostages are three American missionaries from my district, which have been unaccounted for since 1993. Additional, additionally, nearly 5,000 Colombian policemen have been killed by narco guerrillas, and nearly 40,000 Colombians have been murdered in this conflict over the past decade. In fact, more deaths occurred in Colombia last year from the drug war uh, than, in the, than in Kosovo during the uh, recent inhumanity that we saw in that uh, country. Yet this war is little recognized by the United States and has been largely ignored by this administration. Our United States drug czar recently confirmed that the dual threats of narcotic trafficking and the rebel insurgency have become indistinguishable. And while the administration grasps for an effective policy to deal with what they've now termed an emergency, Colombia's narco-terrorism now poses the single greatest threat to the stability of our entire hemisphere. What brought about, about uh, this situation and what brought us to the brink of this disaster? Today we'll examine this question along with a series of other critical issues, including this administration's in inability or unwillingness to deliver drug-fighting support and equipment even today, to our trusted allies in Colombia. Time and again, this administration has ignored the emerging situation in Colombia, despite congressional oversight hearings 
that have tried repeatedly to call attention to the impending crisis. In February and July of 1997, the subcommittee held oversight hearings on the counter drug problem in Colombia. In March of 1998, this subcommittee held an oversight hearing on regional counter drug efforts. At the same time, the House International Relations Committee held a hearing on Colombia's heroin crisis in June of 1998. A hearing, they also held a hearing on the implementation of the Western Hemisphere Drug Elimin Elimination Act uh, in March of 1999. And recently, they also held hearings on Colombia and, and Panama, the situation there. By contrast, this administration has compounded the situation in Colombia by reversing course on important policy issues. Just recently, this administration issued a policy, policy reversal on information sharing with Col the uh, Colombian military. In 1996 and 1997, when this administration decertified Colombia without a national interest waiver, it severely undermined the legitimate drug fighting efforts of General Serrano, and the, who heads the Colombian National Police, and also cut off IMET uh, training and critical equipment so badly needed in that country at that time. Executing any effective anti-narcotics program has been fatally handicapped by the absence of United States intelligence sharing uh, due in part to the reduced air coverage after the forced closure of Howard Air Force Base in Panama. It wasn't bad enough that we didn't give them information that we should be sharing. Uh, we now have a situation with the forced closing of Panama uh, Air Force Base and the U.S. being kicked out of Panama that our forward uh, surveillance uh, flights are down to almost nothing. This gap in surveillance capability has put the entire region at risk now and for many, many months to come. This administration has also dis displayed a schizophrenic approach to providing aid to Colombia. While very publicly calling for $1 billion in emergency aid last week, this same administration requested only $40 million for Colombia just six months ago and blocked assistance, all assistance there two years ago. Indeed, in a bold display of hypocrisy, the administration's FY2000 budget request did not include a single dollar of the $280 uh, million dollars authorized by Congress for Colombia under the Western Hemispheric Drug Elimination Act an emergency congressional appropriation, which uh, was initiated by the former chair of the Drug Policy uh, Oversight uh, Committee, Mr. Hastert, uh, in the last Congress. And I just found uh, yesterday, I was reading, uh, have an op-ed here, that I found uh, that Mr. Hastert now Speaker of the House, again chaired this uh, responsibility in the previous Congress. Saturday, the November 29th, it's an op-ed, Voice of the People, what is it, in the Chicago Tribune, it's uh, 1997. And this is, this is just two sentences out of his uh, statement. With 60% of all heroin seizures uh, being Colombian dope, now I showed you the chart uh, that we got to, to uh, we're up to 75 percent, but this was uh, at that particular time. What has the Clinton administration done to combat uh, this latest craze? The short answer is nothing but to uh, vacillate. And then he also went on to say, the White House and its drug czar, Barry McCaffrey, must develop a strategic plan for com combating the looming uh, heroin problem and he goes on and uh, asks why uh, helicopters, uh, uh, that are Huey helicopters, uh, which can operate uh, safely at altitudes, must uh, and ammunition uh, must get to uh, Colombia. These are questions that he asked in '97 why they weren't getting there. And uh, without objection, I'd like to make this part of the record.
Worse still, this administration has resisted congressional efforts to ensure that needed drug fighting equipment makes, it, uh, makes its way to Colombia in a timely manner. The administration has fought us on Black Hawk utility helicopters uh, getting to Colombia for the past three years, and to date, not a single Black Hawk helicopter has yet made it to Colombia. Notably, there is one sitting right now on a tarmac in Stanford, uh, Connecticut, as, as I speak. Likewise, this administration fought us on upgraded Huey-2 helicopters for the Colombian National Police. Again, to date, only two of 12 upgraded Huey-2 helicopters have made it to Colombia, despite the fact that right now, four Huey-2 helicopters outfitted and ready to go are sitting on a tarmac in Ozark, Alabama. These Huey-2 helicopters are vital to protecting planes, which conduct crop eradication in Colombia, and vital to getting the cocaine labs and vital to eliminating high-altitude heroin poppies. I'm going to show a tape in a few minutes, and you'll also see the results on the Colombian uh, forces and what's happened by not getting the adequate equipment there. Today there, is, today, there are reports of increased activity by the 15,000 Marxist nar narco-terrorist guerrillas, also known as the FARC. This army of insurgents, heavily financed by the drug traffickers, controls nearly one half of Colombia and now actually threatens the hemisphere's second oldest democracy. As chairman of this subcommittee, I'm deeply concerned that the FARC army has gone largely unchecked and is expanding now beyond Colombia's uh, borders. The United States can ill afford further instability in this region. With 20% of the United States daily supply of crude and refined oil imports coming from that area, and with the strategically important uh, Panama Canal located just 150 miles to the north, the national security implications of Colombian rebel activity spilling over into neighboring countries are now enormous. Uh, I just spoke about 20 percent of our oil supply, and I obtained some tapes from a, uh, some pri a private firm, uh, videotapes, and with permission, I'd like to show them. It takes approximately three and a half to four minutes, uh, and this uh, graphically displays what we're facing there. Could we play those tapes, please? These are uh, private tapes by a commercial uh, company. Can we advance that a little bit? Because I think they didn't uh, start it at the right point. It's, I just want to show uh, three and a half minutes of it. These, uh, these tapes were taken by a private concern uh, that was hired by the oil pipelines to try to protect the uh, oil pipelines down there, but it shows the kind of equipment that we're tr we have been attempting to get to the national police uh, that they don't have. It's, and it's absolutely incredible that a private firm can get this equipment down, has gotten this equipment down there. These pictures are taken in 97 and 1998. This helicopter pilot does everything wrong as he attempts to land his Russian-built MI-17 with 21 troops aboard too close to a site where the pipeline was sabotaged the previous day. He doesn't wait for the surveillance aircraft to clear the landing zone. Flames are seen coming from the port engine as ground fire impacts the helicopter. What would have been a survivable incident in a tactical helicopter with two large troop doors on the sides becomes a flaming coffin for this transport helicopter with disabled hydraulic rear clamshell doors. All 21 troops died while the pilots escaped. 
Again, we didn't get the helicopters that they requested uh, there. ...on the pipeline is clearly seen as the aircraft orbits the site. Soon after, a man with two shovels is seen climbing from the hole. He joins another man with a white bag beneath the trees. Explosives were later found in the hole and deactivated. These pictures were all taken with night vision equipment. Everything you see is at night. And they've never been shown before. Again, this is all commercial equipment uh, and hired uh, Briseño, alias Gran Nobles, the regional commander of the FARC, is seen entering a drug processing facility and FARC command post. A high-frequency radio antenna was noted. Briseño is wanted for the recent murders of three American citizens. This is a commercial firm identifying the murders of three American citizens. Again, all infrared at night. What, what kind of infrared is, is being used here? Just a sophisticated can, can we find out? But it's a commercial, yeah. The twisted pipeline is seen projecting from this oil-filled bomb crater. Pollution to the groundwater and local wildlife habitat is evident. During the year in which this incident was recorded, the Canyon Limon pipeline was attacked 66 times, causing extensive ecological and environmental damage. This gives you a little bit of an uh, idea of what's going on there, the difficulty we face. Uh, the, the helicopters that were quest requested even by uh, Chairman uh, Hastert when he was chairman uh, were not there. The equipment uh, is not there. The insurgent that see that we face, the inability of us to even go after or provide equipment to go after the murderers of Americans, and yet a commercial firm uh, can uh, uh, easily identify them. Finally, the ecological uh, damage that's being done uh, to that country and the attempts by the Marxist guerrillas to cut off uh, the oil supply, which uh, uh, certainly is in the vital interest of the United States. In conclusion, uh, with drugs flood flooding our borders and this pending regional turmoil, our vital national interests are undeniably at stake in this situation. We face a very serious and growing challenge. The question is what policies and strategies our, our country and our executive agencies and this administration will adopt to meet the threat and protect the vital interests of the United States in this region. Excuse me for taking more than my time, but we wanted to provide the subcommittee uh, with that information. I'm pleased at this time to yield uh, to uh, Mr. Towns, who's acting as our ranking member this morning. Welcome, and you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And when you're the chairman, you can use a lot of time. <laughs> I learned that from you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Let me begin by first thanking you, uh, for the work that you're doing in this area and also to uh, the ranking member, uh, Ms. Mink, and uh, members of the committee for the work that you're doing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing as well on the narcotics threat from Colombia. Between 1990 and 1998, Colombia received about $625 million in U.S. counter-narcotics assistance. In addition, the United States military provides 160 U.S. service personnel as military advisors to the government of Colombia. <coughs> this infusion of aid has made Colombia the third largest recipient of United States military assistance in the world. Despite this commitment of money and manpower, the GAO estimates that 
coca leaf production in Colombia has increased by 50% since 1996. In a June 1999 report, GAO estimated that Colombia currently produces 80% of the world's cocaine and 60% of the heroin used in the United States. Given our level of support and our level of effort, these results call our current policy into question. What they would say in my neighborhood back in Brooklyn, it appears that we are hustling backwards. It is my understanding that recently there have been calls for an additional one billion in assistance for Colombia. However, given the dismal results we have seen for the money we have spent thus far, I am not sure that more money is the answer to this question. Additionally, many aspects of the situation in Colombia seem to require our re-examination. There's a civil war in Colombia that has been going on for approximately 40 years. The government of Colombia has lost 40 to 50 percent of the country's territory to left-wing rebels. The State Department and numerous human rights groups have reported that paramilitary groups aligned with the Army of Colombia murder and kill civilians because of their political beliefs. And drug traffickers may have corrupted every side of this conflict by supplying vast amount of money and means to continue the kind of chaos that allows the traffickers to continue their illegal operations. Mr. Chairman, there are many problems in Colombia. It seems to me that additional military spending will only exacerbate the chaos in Colombia. Unilateral United States action is not the answer, and I'm convinced of that. The Colombians need to reignite the peace process. The United States needs to involve the international community and especially other Latin American countries in a peacekeeping effort. We need to provide humanitarian and development assistance to the people of Colombia. I think that's important. But most of all, we need to address the cocaine threat here at home by increasing our prevention and treatment efforts. We need to have more slots for treatment of people, and we need to have a stronger education and prevention program. Again, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for holding this hearing today and salute you for all the work that you're doing in this area. And I look forward to hearing you know, from our witnesses. I see we have two outstanding members of Congress who have visited that country many, many times. Uh, uh, Congressman Gilman and Congressman Burton. So I look forward to hearing from them as well. At this time, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'd like to recognize our Vice Chairman, Mr. Barr, a gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, I just heard one of the most amazing statements I've ever heard, that we're here trying to assist the narco-terrorist war, or trying to assist against the narco-terrorist war down there, and we have somebody say that trying to provide additional U.S. military system, much, much of which has been promised and not delivered for many years, will exacerbate the situation. Uh, I don't even know how to respond to that sort of statement. Uh, in looking at the crisis in, uh, in Colombia, uh, and trying to think up an analogy that fits it, I, I, I thought of several. One, the, the tail wagging the dog for many years, where a State Department zooms in with an electron microscope and looks at uh, some allegation of human rights violation, never mind the vast human rights violations perpetrated by the FARC and the other groups. I've also thought of Nero fiddling while Rome burns, uh, except Nero is replaced by the State Department, or what many have tried to do in the State Department over the years, and that is simply hear no evil, see no evil, uh, speak no evil. Uh, in refusing uh, to acknowledge for years until apparently today, I see at least the State Department representative will acknowledge that there is indeed a narco-terrorist problem facing uh, this hemisphere uh, in Colombia. Uh, but uh, uh, the situation is far beyond trying to find ways of describing the mismanagement uh, of the U.S. State Department in responding to this threat to our hemisphere. 
the only bright spot is it could be much worse were it not for the work of DEA uh, and our military in trying desperately uh, to assist uh, our allies in Colombia, most notably the heroic General Serrano, uh, in meeting uh, this tremendous threat, despite the uh, what seemed to be deliberate efforts over the years recently by the State Department to thwart the efforts of DEA, refusing to fill billets authorized by Congress for additional DEA slots, uh, refusing to uh, allow the provision of additional helicopters and gun mounts, uh, and even today, uh, helicopters that were promised uh, to be down there uh, by this month, by the end of last month, are still sitting stateside somewhere. Uh, it indeed is a crisis, uh, made worse by uh, the fact that the United States is going to completely withdraw its forward military operations, which have been very important in the counter-narcotics efforts from, from uh, Panama. Uh, turning the Panama Canal and all of its military assets that we have shared and operated uh, with the Panamanians in a very successful uh, effort over the years uh, back over to Panama without any provision for continuing that very, very strategically important uh, base of operations. Uh, it'll be very interesting to hear from uh, General McCaffrey, who has just recently returned. Uh, and, uh, of course, I suppose we should, you know, thank the State Department for at least now recognizing that there is uh, a narco-terrorist problem in Colombia. Um, but there is indeed a crisis down there, and, and rather than turn a blind eye to it and say that our military assistance is causing it, uh, the most preposterous statement I can, I can imagine, we ought to be desperately searching for ways to assist uh, our allies in Colombia, because this indeed uh, is a very serious problem. Uh, that is not just a problem for uh, the people of Colombia, uh, the people of Latin America and Central America and the United States, uh, but the entire hemisphere. Uh, I appreciate our colleagues being with us today to share their extensive uh, knowledge uh, on this and look forward to the additional panels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the uh, indulgence of the su subcommittee, I'm going to recognize uh, and I recognize one person uh, from the minority, then recognize our two chairmen who uh, we have a chairman of the full committee, a uh, member of our subcommittee. Uh, Mr. Cummings, did you want to make a, a brief opening? Of course, statement? of course, Mr. Chairman. And then we'll go to. I certainly do. Uh, first of all, good morning to everyone, and I'm certainly pleased to be here. Uh, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have. Um, uh, serving on this subcommittee, try to address the problems of drugs throughout uh, the world and certainly this country. And I'm sure that you are well aware that, that I'm a strong advocate of sound counter narcotics efforts. And I will say it every single time I have an opportunity. Sometimes I really just think we don't get it. This morning, I left my community of Baltimore, a drug-infested area, where a lot of the drugs that we're talking about today have already taken the lives of so many children. The same children that I watched 14 or 15 years ago as they grew up, now walking around like zombies. This is only 40 miles away from here. and. You know, as much, I, I am very concerned about what is happening in Colombia, and I think we ought to do everything we can to address this issue. I come here today to speak for the dead, the ones who don't even know where Colombia is, the ones who, like I said a few years ago, had hope the ones who have become victims, and I call them victims because every time I see one of them standing on a corner like zombies, the pain, I cannot begin to tell you how painful it is because I know that they're in so much pain that they don't even know they're in pain. And that's why it's so important to me and to my district that we concentrate more of our efforts on treatment. I think Mr. Towns said it 
quite nicely. He used the term hustling backwards. Let me tell you something. If you don't have a demand, you don't have to worry about Columbia. You don't have to worry about it. But neighborhood after neighborhood throughout this country, and if it has not hit yours, it will. Neighborhood after neighborhood. People who cannot afford these drugs, right now as we speak, are breaking into houses to get $5, $10, or whatever for crack cocaine. What are our answers? We have one level of sentencing for powder cocaine, another for crack. In Baltimore, our jails are filled with black men and black women rotting away. And so it is that today you say that we come here to address this whole issue of Columbia. And sure, it's Columbia, but there's a direct link and I admire you, Mr. Burton, and I admire you, Mr. Gilman. But I want you to do me a favor. I want you to come to my neighborhood and understand why I push for treatment so very hard. There are not enough treatment slots. We've probably got, for every treatment slot that we have, we've probably got a demand for 100. People who want to get off of drugs. And so the chairman said something that I, I agree with. He said, we must look again in his opening statement, we must look again at our stra strategies and policies and protect the vital interests of the United States. Mr. Chairman, I agree with you 100%. We must look at them and reevaluate them. Because as I see this Colombian war with these rebels and folk going against each other, I mean, I don't know how much we can do there, but I know one thing, what can be done in my neighborhood when some high schools have 80% of the young people dropping out between ninth grade and 12th grade, many of them standing on corners, going nowhere fast. And so if we are going to reevaluate, let us make sure we reevaluate to provide more treatment. 60% of the heroin used in the United States is from Colombia. The Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has estimated that 55,000 heroin addicts are in the state of Maryland and 71% of them live in Baltimore City. And keep in mind, Baltimore only has a population of 674,000. I've got a serious crisis in my district. And, and although I have some concerns regarding the large amount of funding requested to address the complex problems in Columbia, I am eager to hear from the witnesses today as to how we can work together to get these drugs off of our streets. And I thank you and I look forward to the testimony. I thank the uh, gentleman from Maryland. I'm now pleased to recognize uh, a gentleman uh, who serves on our uh, subcommittee and also chairs one of the most uh, important uh, committees in the House of Representatives, uh, the chairman of the House International Relations Committee, Mr. Gilman. Mr. Gilman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our colleagues on our subcommittee for holding today's very important timely hearing on the narcotics threat from Colombia and also what we should be doing in reevaluating our drug strategy. And I appreciate what Mr. Towns and Mr. Cummings have said with regard to their concerns and criticisms of our existing strategy. And I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for your continuing efforts through this committee of giving attention <clears throat> to the effectiveness of our drug war and focusing the nation's attention on what we should be doing. The presence this morning of two full committee chairmen with oversight responsibility in the international fight against illicit drugs I think is indicative, indicative of the seriousness of this problem. And you've pointed out some very important statistics. Mr. Chairman, we all recognize that Colombia is probably one of the most significant drug producing nation in the world, producing some 80% of the world's cocaine. And as if that were not bad enough in the last six years, and while the administration seemed to be looking in another direction, Colombia captured 75% of the American heroin market. 
producing 80% of the world's cocaine and capturing 75% of our heroin market. Colombia is in our own backyard. It's not over in Asia. It's not uh, thousands and thousands of miles away. Its capital city in Bogota is just three air hours from Miami. What happens in Colombia is immediately affected to, uh, in our cities, in our streets, in our schoolyards, in our communities, and the deadly drugs it produces and exports, and the sophisticated drug dealing uh, gangs that are in charge of the world's trafficking of drugs. Illicit drugs are directly linked <clears throat> to the growing strength and aggressiveness of the narco guerrillas who today threaten Colombia's very survival as a viable democracy. Congressman Rangel and I, when we were working on a select committee on narcotics, stood in the plaza in the capital city of Colombia and saw how the drug traffickers had invaded the Supreme Court of that country and taken it over and held the judges hostage. I don't know if Mr. Towns was with us at that time. And it was appalling to see how the drug traffickers had their impact on the, the, the very core of the government of that country. Now, the narco-state status is a term used today very often when they discuss Colombia. Colombia is on the verge of becoming a narco-state. Our nation's response under the current administration to both the increasing drug threat and the growing insurgency menace in Colombia has been benign neglect at best, and I venture to say gross negligence at worst. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me, we have been providing significant funding in many areas, but we've not been providing an effective strategy and effective resources. And the response to the contention that the answer to all of this is to reduce demand, I think leaves something to be desired. I think those of us who've been involved in the drug problem, and I've been involved since my coming to Congress some 27 years ago, I think we all recognize in examining various strategies that you must not just reduce demand, and that's important, but you must also reduce supply. And you must do both simultaneously. And you reduce demand by going, uh, you reduce supply by going to the sources, by eradicating. And then when it gets in the mainstream of distribution, you interdict. And then when it gets to our shorelines, we convict and make certain that our police uh, agencies have the wherewithal to do that. And then associate that with reducing demand through education, through our curriculum in our schools, and then also to treat and rehabilitate. But we can't take money from one to give it to the others. And I mentioned to Mr. Cummings, the mayor of Baltimore had thought that legalization for a long period of time was the way to go. I don't think legalization is the way to go. It only proliferates a problem. I think some of the countries overseas, such as the Netherlands and Great Britain had tried that and found it not to be effective. We must bear in mind that we have to uh, focus our attention on all of these areas and do it simultaneously and not take the funds from one to give to the other, as we regrettably have done by our present administration. The lives of thousands of our children have been affected by the administration's neglect. Mr. Cummings, I went to Baltimore. Kwesi Mifumi took me there to examine some of the problems years ago. And we recognize that there are problems in each of our major cities. And we have to do a better job of educating, but also we have to cut down the supply that goes to those cities. Especially a failed one-dimensional drug policy based on treating the wounded from drug use here at home has not been effective. Recognizing the burgeoning Colombian heroin problem in our nation and an absence of an effective strategy by the administration a number of us in the Congress, as far back as 1996, pushed for more aid, more source of resources to try to stem the flow from Colombia. 
We called for better helicopters and hard-hitting anti-narcotics police in Colombia to pursue the opium poppy at its source and to get to the higher Andes plateau where a good deal of the heroin was growing. It's long been our United States law enforcement consensus that getting the Colombian poppy before it's processed into heroin was always the most cost-effective strategy, particularly with the limited growth, some 6,000 hectares of Columbia opium. It's a plan that would be most likely to succeed. Geographically, Columbia is bigger than the states of Texas and Kansas combined. It's rugged, high-altitude terrain makes operations difficult for our law enforcement community. Accordingly, air mobility for anti-drug operations is critical. The courageous Columbia National Police, they've lost over 4,000 in fighting this war. They do the drug eradication program. They've estimated that they have a need for 100 helicopters to do, be able to do the job properly and that they could eradicate if they had that kind of equipment. 90% of their anti-drug operations requires helicopters and in 40% of their, their time, they face hostile fire. You saw what happened to one of the helicopters under hostile fire in that short video we just saw. Today, the drug police in Colombia has less than 25 helicopters operating. Only two of the six twin-engine helicopters the state provided them for opium eradication last year are flying today. They provided them for opium eradication last year are flying today. The rest are hangar queens. You might examine some of the photos over here of what they look like. They're sitting in the hangars and incapable of conducting the kind of operations that are needed. Is there any wonder then why the drug battle at the source has been so ineffective in Colombia? Yes, we're spending money, but we're not doing it effectively or in the right direction. We in the Congress have appropriated sufficient money to purchase and directed the delivery of over 30 new high-performance, long-range, high-altitude-capable helicopters to the drug police in Colombia to eradicate drugs at their source. And we've continuously urged an increased mobility approach since 1996, and to date, despite our continuous urging, regrettably, the administration has delivered only two of these new helicopters to the drug police flight line in Colombia. Regrettably, both of those choppers were ill-fitted, ill-equipped, and one was damaged on arrival. As a result of these kind of failures, the Colombian heroin availability in our nation has been extremely high. The price of this deadly Colombian heroin remains low, while the purity is higher than we've ever seen. And that results in the deaths and overdoses on our streets and communities unabated from Colombian heroin that could have and should have been eradicated in the source in the high Andes years ago. Yes, reduce demand, but also reduce the kind of supply that's increasing the demand. Mr. Chairman, the administration's failure to get to the opium poppy fields in the high Andes is directly responsible for the massive heroin crisis on the East Coast and the United States. And it's not just Baltimore. Our cities in New York State are having a severe impact, as well as cities across the country. If the administration were to devote the same amount of effort to the real war on drugs in Colombia as the State Department does in explaining to our committees and yours why already paid for helicopters, helicopters have not arrived in Colombia, I think we would have won that war by now. If the administration was serious about stopping drugs at its source, those high performance helicopters would have been in Colombia long ago doing the job the Congress intended it to do eliminating hard drugs at their source before they reach our shores and before they get into cities like Baltimore and elsewhere. Accordingly, Mr. Chairman, I urge that when we hear 
These new pleas for massive amounts of emergency aid to Colombia for the fight against drugs, let us ask why anyone should take them seriously based on the abysmal track record of providing aid to date. We will hear today about the massive increase in coca production in Colombia. That too is partially the result of this failure to deliver the kind of equipment that's needed by the Colombian National Police, the CNP. Mr. Chairman, Colombia's development as a narco state is not new. In 1997, Colombia overtook Peru as the world's number one producer of narcotics. We in Congress pleaded with the administration for immediate action, and all we got was some more dithering. Peru's willingness to take the steps necessary to drastically reduce coca production forced producers to move across the border into southern Colombia. And there, the CNP is unable to reach the numerous remote coca fields without the armed, long-range choppers that Congress has demanded. There are fundamental differences in philosophy between those of us in the Congress who monitor the Colombian situation closely and the administration. The administration, without a significant counter-narcotic strategy of its own, has been willing to sit back and has become a cheerleader for President Pastrana's fizzling peace process without backing it up with aid and support to get at the heart of the problem with illicit drugs financing the growing insurgency in Colombia. President Pastrana, Colombia's president, the well-intentioned cannot achieve peace from a position of weakness. Regrettably, our State Department has contributed to the current confused policy in Latin America's oldest democracy. That confusion has flowed from meeting with FARC leaders and failing to provide even this basic anti-narcotics aid to take away much of the source of the insurgency strength, the illicit narcotic monies and they are substantial in the billions of dollars. Let us make no mistake that we in the Congress want peace in Colombia, but not on the terms of narco-terrorists. I think that's the direction in which Colombia is heading. The actions of the FARC have demonstrated that it has no intention of peaceful resolution. It's still kidnapping people, still killing people, some of whom are Americans. The future of Colombia and the issue of illicit drugs are intimately related. The tragic loss of five American servicemen and their two Colombian Air Force partners not long ago on a counter-narcotics mission in the high Andes shows us that the fate of that troubled nation and ours are closely linked. We ignore events in Colombia at our own peril, and I hope the alarm bells that General McCaffrey has recently sounded is not coming too late, and we thank General McCaffrey for sounding that alarm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the uh, gentleman, uh, member of our subcommittee, uh, chairman of the, uh, the uh, International Relations Committee. I'm pleased to recognize at this time uh, the chairman of our full committee, also an ex officio member of our subcommittee, uh, for his statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Micah. I'd like to uh, preface my remarks by saying to uh, Mr. Cummings and Mr. Towns that I share their concern about uh, uh, making sure that the people who have become addicted have an avenue for returning to society. But I'd like to point out to them that uh, the administration's counter-narcotics budget in fiscal year 1998 was $16.5 billion for treatment and prevention and only $1 billion for overseas eradication. That's not to say we shouldn't do more. Maybe we should do more. But we should certainly provide more resources to fight the producers and the drug cartels around the world. There's a number of reasons why Colombia is important. One of those is because should democracy fall there and a narco state prevail, where a Marxist-led government run by the FARC narco-terrorists succeed democracy, we're at severe risk here in the United States. Colombia is the oldest democracy in Latin America. It has vast oil reserves and plenty of 
untapped natural resources. So the strategic importance of Colombia to the United States is that it controls access to the Isthmus of Panama, which will control the Panama Canal in just a few months. The world's economies rely on access to the canal. Should Colombia's democracy fail, the result could be a domino effect through all of Central America. Is all this likely to happen? Probably not. But could it happen? You bet. It could happen. You know, back in the 1980s, we had a real problem in Central America with the Sandinistas and the FMLN in, in El Salvador. So Nicaragua and El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduras were all at risk. We thought we had put all of those problems behind us. But in my mind, they've been resurrected by the narco traffickers in Colombia. Because if they succeed there and Colombia becomes a narco state, then the Panama Canal right next door, right adjacent to it, is likely to be imperiled. And they can move right up through the Central American region. And uh, we're going to have an immigration problem that you wouldn't believe, as well as more military problems. The time for action has been upon us for some time. I'm encouraged that there's finally some concern by the administration. They're finally recognizing the need for a source country strategy in response to the influx of hard drugs on American streets and American schoolyards. Chairman Gilman, Speaker Hastert, Chairman Micah and myself have been writing letters and holding hearings for nearly three years trying to get someone in the White House to pay attention. Instead of a source country strategy, We've gotten an unbalanced approach, heavy on domestic treatment and prevention, which statistics show has failed, and light on interdiction and eradication, which is the preference of law enforcement. It's unfortunate that it took the tragic deaths of five U.S. Army personnel in Colombia to enlighten this administration that there's a problem down there. A blind person could have seen there's a problem. Colombian President Pastrana has underestimated the FARC's capabilities. He's overestimated his own ability to hold together a shaky democracy marred by four decades of civil strife and supported by a false economy based in large part on money from narco trafficking. By capitulating to the FARC demands in the peace negotiations, President Pastrana and Colombia's democracy are in worse shape now than when the peace process began. If we haven't learned anything throughout history, we ought to learn this. Appeasement does not work. And giving the narco traffickers an inch is going to encourage them to take a mile. Someone needs to ask, what does the FARC gain from peace? And the answer is, they don't gain a darn thing. Currently, the FARC has an estimated income of $100 million a month from facilitating narco trafficking, kidnapping, and extortion. They have a demilitarized zone the size of Indiana where guerrilla-style cowardly attacks are planned and launched, and where attackers can vanish back into oblivion. They have the Pastrana government exactly where they want it, hunkered down, absorbing repeated attacks with little ability to respond. Clearly, the FARC has no incentive to reach peace, and Colombia has endured a year's worth of escalated violence just to prove it. Absent a peace strategy of its own, the U.S. State Department has blindly backed Pastrana's fledgling peace efforts. At Pastrana's request, American diplomats negotiated with and legitimized FARC leaders last December. This is the same FARC that the State Department placed on its own list of world terrorist organizations. And it's been a policy of this government for years and years and years not to negotiate with terrorists, and yet our State Department went down there and met with them, and as far as I know, are still negotiating with them uh, in one way or another. Despite this, one American diplomat continued to contact with the FARC leaders even after the murder of the three Americans in March. The lack of counter-narcotic strategy by the Clinton administration has never been more evident than in drug czar Barry McCaffrey's $1 billion aid package. This is less than one year's income for the FARC guerrillas. Think about that. Less than one year's income to the FARC. This money targets the Colombian Army, rampant with allegations of human rights abuses. In Colombia in 1997, General McCaffrey said he supported Black Hawk helicopters for the Colombian National Police, the CNP, known as the best counter-narcotics police in the world. However, days later in Washington, 
General McCaffrey opposed counter-narcotics aid to Colombia, the world's top drug-producing country. He wrote that the Black Hawks, quote, would threaten to undermine the objectives of the United States international counter-drug policy. Two different opinions, and I'd like to submit these for the record, these letters for the record, Mr. Without objection, so ordered. How could Black Hawk helicopters hurt our counter-drug effort? He then complained that Chairman Gilman and myself were trying to, quote, micromanage the war on drugs. Simply put, there is no war on drugs being waged by this administration unless you count the nearly $200 million General McCaffrey spends annually for ONDCP television ads and these frisbees, I don't know, these frisbees and keychains that are up on the easel there in front. This is more than we spend on our counter-narcotics efforts in Colombia, the source of more than 80 percent of the cocaine and 75 percent of the heroin in the United States. Counter-narcotics aid to Colombia has been abysmally low until this year, when Chairman Gilman and I were successful in getting Black Hawks funded for the Colombian National Police, which I want you to know has not yet been delivered. General McCaffrey should have been developing a heroin, heroin strategy, but the fact of the matter is there has been no heroin st strategy from this administration. The Republican Congress has been forced to do the administration's job and then fight to get the necessary equipment down there. Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter several op-ed pieces into the record to clearly establish that Congress recognized the heroin problem several years ago and has attempted to force a reluctant Clinton administration to even address the issue. Without objection, so ordered. General McCaffrey has just returned from, Col from Columbia, and surely he will present you with his first-hand account of the situation. News reports quote him as proposing a $1 billion course of action, which will help save Colombia from both the narco traffickers and the FARC terrorists. $1 billion is a lot of money, but as I said before, it's less than the estimated $1.2 billion the FARC takes in every single year from drugs, kidnapping, and extortion. General McCaffrey's proposal undoubtedly includes funds to stand up a Colombian army capable of counter-narcotics operations, which sound good on the surface. But given the tainted human rights record of the Colombian Army, even in vetted units, it is unlikely aid to them would pass the administration's litmus test for the, quote, sp spirit of Leahy. This, of course, is the law named after the senator from Vermont, prohibiting lethal assistance without cutting through a mountain of bureaucratic red tape. This is the favorite first obstacle that the State Department usually places in front of any assistance to Colombia. The Colombian Army, while understandably a pet project for a former SYNC Southcom, is in tatters. And even the Pentagon estimates it would take a Herculean effort and more than five years to vet, train, and equip a Colombian Army capable of handling this mission. Reg regrettably, Colombia may not have five years of democracy left. The good news is there's a group in Colombia who is already in place, are well trained, and are willing to do what needs to be done to fight our war on drugs. They're the Colombian National Police, headed by the legendary General Jose Serrano. In a poll in last week's Colombian newspaper, El Tempo, Serrano's popularity, 71%, is second only to the Catholic Church, which is 77%. Colombians proudly say, after my God, my General Serrano. General Serrano's men have a clean human rights record and the desire to do the job. All they need is the equipment. Mr. Chairman, actions speak louder than words. This administration has promised Chairman Gilman and myself more than 40 new helicopters for the Colombian National Police since 1996. As of this morning, only two, only two of the 40 are on the flight line in Colombia. Why can't the State Department get these helicopters to General Serrano? Mr. Chairman, out of curiosity, I checked with the Indiana Army National Guard. They have 32 Hueys and seven Blackhawks. Today, General Serrano has only 23 operating helicopters to cover his entire country, where 95 percent of his missions require helicopters, and that's the size of Texas and Kansas combined. Before Congress embraces or considers General McCaffrey's $1 billion aid package, shouldn't the administration be forced to make good on its commitments to General Serrano and the Congress regarding helicopters for the Colombian National Police? 
Congress has many questions, but General Serrano has more than 4,000 questions, which represents the lives of the men he's lost fighting our war on drugs. The State Department's record on delivery of assistance to the CNP is abysmal at best. Even if we pass this proposal today and worked every day for the next year, General McCaffrey knows there's no way that that aid could reach Columbia next year, either due to incompetence or a lack of will at the State Department. Clearly, this is an effort to say the Clinton administration finally did something about drugs before next year's election cycle. It's coming way too late. This chart shows the string of unkept promises by the administration. It could be much longer, but we chose only to highlight the helicopter situation. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to insert a, a stack of unkept State Department promises, including dozens of letters on everything from ammunition to weapons to helicopters into the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. I'll turn my attention to the State Department's insatiable desire to mislead Congress on what is actually happening in Colombia. The Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement has a history of incompetence and inability to deliver counter-narcotics assistance, which is its job. Every new assistant secretary who comes in, Secretary Beers included, says they cannot be responsible for the actions of the previous secretary. Secretary Beers, the buck stops here. You've told me and my staff on a number of occasions that the first tranche of 35 new Huey II helicopters would be in Columbia last fall. Then you said in March, then April, then June, then July. Now it's August. When are they going to get there? I was told by Ambassador Robert Gelbart in September of 1996 that 10 of these were going to be delivered. That was three years ago. There are only two on the flight line this morning. There have been four Hueys, Huey IIs ready for shipment from Alabama for a number of weeks. Why haven't they been delivered? Your department dropped the ball on this, and it isn't the first time. In June of last year, you sold Mr. Hastert, Mr. Callahan, and Mr. Souter on trading three Blackhawks for six Bell 212s and 10 Huey II helicopters. Chairman Gilman and myself reluctantly accepted your compromise because you gave us your word. Today, I'm told by Narcotics Affairs Section personnel in Columbia, four of those six 12, 212, Bell 212s are not flying. Secretary Beers, despite your testimony at the International Relations Committee in March, they have never had more than four in the air at any one time. Chairman Gilman, I'm sure, remembers it very vividly as well. You told us, quote, Congressman, I can assure you these will not be hangar queens. And as Chairman Gil Gilman pointed out, they are. I don't know that we have those up there again, but I hope before this hearing's over, we'll once again be able to look at the condition of the helicopters that were in when Secretary Beers gave them to the CNP. They've spent several million dollars to repair these aging helicopters. Further, INL got rid of these helicopters just before they're scheduled to go down again for six more months for their mandatory five-year checkup. So we're sending them junk. Will these piles of metal ever be of use to General Serrano? So it's a facade. It's a facade. General McCaffrey would have to rely on this same State Department crowd to get this $1 billion aid package delivered. By the time this assistance would arrive in Columbia, we would be trying to figure out who's going to be the last who's going to be in the last helicopter off the roof of the American Embassy in Bogota. Because of inaction by this administration, the risks to freedom we helped eliminate in the 1980s in Central and South America could very well reemerge and reemerge with a vengeance. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad Colombia is finally on the radar screen of this administration. Maybe someone at the White House will finally hear our pleas to get General Serrano the helicopter and the equipment he needs. I just hope the 4,000 CNP officers have not died in vain and that democracy will prevail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your statement and uh, comments. I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Uh, Schakowsky from Illinois. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the opportunity to hear the, the testimony of these two esteemed chairmen and, and my colleagues. I want to just um, take a moment to make a, a statement which actually is more in the way of a series of, of questions. The, uh, the recent call by General Barry McCaffrey to increase 
spending on drug enforcement in Colombia puts the United States as a, at a crossroads. Do we invest in a militaristic drug war that escalates the regional conflict, or do we attack the drug market by investing in prevention and treatment at home and seek to assist in stabilizing Colombia? According to the GAO, quote, despite two years of extensive herbicide spraying, U.S. estimates show there has not been any net reduction in coca cultivation, net coca cultivation actually increased 50 percent, unquote, and this 50 percent increase in coca cultivation comes after $625 million in counter-narcotics operations yeah. in Colombia between 1990 and 1998. Considering the demonstrated failure of militarized eradication efforts to date, why should we believe that investing even more money in this plan will achieve a different result? And what will it take to achieve total victory in Colombia? Are we prepared to make that type of investment in dollars and lives? And if not, what is the purpose of this aid? Considering the fact that more than 100,000 civilians have died in Colombia's civil war and five servicemen recently on a reconnaissance flight, is it ethical to escalate the war in Colombia in order to prevent Americans from purchasing cocaine? Will the aid achieve a 10 percent reduction or 20 percent or 50 percent reduction in drugs? What is the target amount? Or is the purpose to degrade the military capability of the FARC or bomb them to the negotiating table? Exactly what is it that we believe this aid will accomplish? Is it the first in a series of blank checks for a war that has no foreseeable end game? What is the exit strategy? With the continued failure of a military solution to drug production in Colombia, why shouldn't an innovative alternative development approach be, be used instead? Why not spend half or all of the money on crop substitution or development? A landmark study of cocaine markets by the RAND Corporation found that providing treatment to cocaine users is 10 times more effective than drug interdiction schemes and 23 times more cost effective than eradicating coca at its source. If decreasing drug use in America is the ultimate goal, why aren't we putting equal resources into domestic demand reduction? where each dollar spent is 23 times more effective than eradication. Today we're discussing a billion dollars for Colombia, but yesterday we cut one billion dollars from the COPS program here at home. A recent study by researchers at SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, has indicated that 48 percent of the need for drug treatment, not including alcohol abuse, is unmet in the United States. Why is it that we can find emergency funds for overseas military operations while continuing to ignore the enormous lack of drug treatment here at home? Mr. Chairman, before becoming entangled in a foreign war, it seems to me that the Congress should use its oversight authority to require the administration to explain how this escalation will reduce illicit drug use at home better than investment in prevention and treatment in the United States. The administration should also explain how increasing funds for a policy will change the result when past increases in support have not changed the outcome. These troubling strategic issues need to be resolved in a satisfactory manner before we increase our involvement in Colombia. I appreciate the opportunity to make this statement. Thank uh, the gentlelady for her statement. And I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate this hearing, and I want to express my thanks to Mr. Burton and Mr. Gilman for their uh, testimony today and their leadership on this issue. After Mr. Burton's uh, testimony, I certainly am looking forward to hearing the uh, testimony of the State Department in reference to those helicopters. And uh, Mr. Gilman, I couldn't agree with you more in regard to the balanced approach that we have to maintain, reducing uh, the demand for cocaine in this country, the demand for drugs, and also going after the source countries. I, as many of the members of this committee, have been to Columbia and, and uh, met General Serrano and appreciate the work that he's doing there. And uh, they do need our assistance. And I respect the uh, questions that have just been raised by the gentlelady from Illinois, very appropriate questions as to what our strategy is. Uh, hopefully we can determine uh, today, uh, so answer some of those questions. I thought for a moment she was speaking of uh, our intervention in Kosovo. 
uh, regarding exit strategy and uh, what our plan is. And this is a region that is very, very close. When you look at uh, uh, the new tribes missionaries that have been captured, perhaps killed, uh, by the uh, FARC guerrillas there, uh, whenever you look at the servicemen that we've lost, this impacts our, the lives of Americans. And so I think it's appropriate that we address our role there and our commitment there, and I'm delighted with this hearing. And while this hearing is primarily designed to highlight the precarious situation in which Columbia finds itself, I want to take a moment, Mr. Chairman, to honor an Arkansan who was on the front lines of our war against drugs in that country. Chief Warrant Officer Thomas Moore, a fellow Arkansan, has paid the ultimate price for the defense of his country. In a little notice incident last month in July, Moore and four of his compatriots lost their lives to keep our kids safe from the scourge of drugs. On July 23, Moore and his fellow air crew took off for a routine intelligent mission over southern Columbia. The crew was tasked with gathering information to support Columbia's counter-drug efforts. The craft disappeared from radar screens while over rebel-controlled territory and later was discovered in the mountains along Columbia's border with Ecuador. There were no survivors. Moore joined the Army in 1988 after attending the Air Force Academy. In 1991, he served with distinction in Southwest Asia during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. After four years of enlisted service, Moore was selected for the Warrant Officer Program. He graduated from flight school in 1993 as a scout helicopter pilot and in 1996 was selected to attend a fixed wing qualification course. He graduated and joined the 204th Military Intelligence Battalion and as a result of his excellent performance, was selected to fly the RC-7, the Army's premier reconnaissance plane. Moore had deployed several times on missions to South America from his post at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. His awards include the Kuwait and Saudi Arabia Liberation Medals, the Army Achievement Medal, and the Army Commendation Medal. Moore, who is from Higdon, Arkansas, is survived by his wife and two children. Mr. Chairman, this happened one month ago, and I do not believe it has captured the attention uh, the recognition that is deserved for these brave uh, soldiers who have really committed themselves to serving our country. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for this opportunity to pay tribute to Chief Warrant Officer Thomas Moore and his fellow soldiers. They embody the spirit that undergirds our determined efforts to fight narco traffickers wherever they seek to ply their poisonous trade. They are indeed unsung heroes. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman for his statement. I'm pleased now to recognize uh, Mr. Reyes, who's joined us. He's a member of the Armed Services Committee. We thank you for joining us this morning, and you're recognized, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate as part of your committee, and I want to uh, tell you that I hold both chairman and the highest esteem. I know they've worked very hard on, uh, on this and many other issues, and including annually on the issue of certification of Mexico, which uh, I think is one of the most important things that we do in this con Congress is recognize the efforts that other countries are uh, making on behalf of fighting uh, drug traffickers and, and international drug smuggling. It occurs to me that uh, in, the, uh, in the context of what we're doing this morning and what your commu committee does, uh, it's very important that we uh, uh, have a clear understanding of what the challenge is and, and what the accuracy is. I uh, came to Congress after 26 and a half years service in the United States uh, Border Patrol, part of the Immigration Naturalization Service. And I will tell you that uh, uh, Border Patrol agents, uh, as part of Operation Snowcap, have been uh, uh, at the forefront of this nation's war on drugs since the early 80s. I had the opportunity to travel to Colombia and uh, observe the uh, activities of the Colombian National Police as well as uh, the participation by DEA and by the United States Border Patrol as a result of Operation Snowcap. So I, I have uh, uh, a good understanding of, uh, of the issue. I have a good perspective based again on experience of what is going on and what has been going on in Colombia for literally several decades. Uh, I have experience under the uh, uh, Reagan administration, under the Bush administration, and obviously under 
uh, this administration. And it occurs to me that we do a lot of, in Congress, a lot of political jousting. And part of what I think is, is important is that we be accurate about framing the argument and not uh, allow politics to uh, interfere with what is very dangerous work for our men and women fighting both in this country and internationally to stop narcotics trafficking. I would, uh, uh, I would tell you that uh, the loss of five soldiers who uh, uh, I represent the 16th District of Texas, which includes Fort Bliss, and the loss of five soldiers occurred not a month ago, but literally uh, less than two weeks ago. Uh, they included Captain Jennifer J. Odom, Captain Jose Santiago, uh, uh, Warren Officer Thomas Moore, as my colleague from Arkansas has already mentioned, uh, Specialist Bruce Clough, and Specialist Ray Kruger. Uh, I would also remind this committee that of all of the five soldiers, we have actually only recovered the remains of three. Uh, two are still on that uh, mountaintop in, uh, in Colombia. And I mention that because it's important that we keep in mind why we're here. It's important that we understand that in order to overcome and to uh, be successful in fighting narcotics trafficking and the scourge of narcotics in our neighborhoods. And we go through this every year when, when the issue of certification comes up. I heard mentioned this morning uh, where the administration was being, was being criticized because they uh, decertified Colombia uh, on two separate occasions. Every year, members uh, here this morning uh, want to see Mexico decertified. So it, it brings to my mind that there's, uh, that there's uh, an issue here of either confusion or hypocrisy at play, and it's not helpful to the efforts and the sacrifices that are being made, not only by the five soldiers who already have lost their lives, but by the efforts of the United States uh, Border Patrol as they participated in this, uh, in this endeavor in past years, by DEA today, by members uh, of the military even as we speak here this morning. Part of the challenge is, as I see it, is to work together. And again, I get back to accuracy. The, I asked you what kind of uh, infrared system was was on that video because uh, uh, from my experience that is that looked more like uh, daylight video than than infrared. Uh, you cannot see smoke uh, from a helicopter after it's been shot and flames coming out in the way that that came out uh, in in terms of uh, in terms of infrared. So again, I make mention of these things so that we can work jointly both as Democrats and Republicans, uh, both as uh, liberals and conservatives, both as those that have an understanding of the issue, not only locally in our neighborhoods, but internationally in scope, uh, uh, as I do, and, and bring forward uh, people that understand that in order for us to succeed in fighting uh, international drug trafficking, in order for us to succeed in being able to come up with a solution, we have to approach this thing from, from the proverbial uh, three-legged uh, stool, and that's with education, with treatment, and with interdiction, law enforcement, however you want to phrase it. All three are important. All three are critical. And it doesn't do us any good uh, to sit here and nitpick when there are the lives of our men and women, both in the military and in law enforcement, at risk uh, uh, both in this country and internationally. I hope that... Uh, and, and I am willing to uh, lend my expertise, Mr. Chairman, uh, in any way that, uh, that I can and that you see fit uh, to help us frame uh, the larger issues, to help us frame uh, the challenge and that, that we face so that uh, together we can reach uh, uh, a successful uh, conclusion to the scourge that frustrates all of us uh, in our neighborhoods and all of us in our capacity as representatives of the people of this country. And I thank you for the opportunity. Thank the gentleman for joining us. Uh, now, now, not to, uh, well, last but not least, uh, a gentleman who's been very active on our subcommittee on this issue, uh, Mr. Souter, the gentleman from Indiana. You're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I also want to, uh, uh, before I make a, a statement here, pay tribute to Chairman Gilman for his uh, leadership in the Narcotics uh, Select Committee as well as International Relations Committee, to Chairman Burton, not only for his work in government reform, but also in international relations in, in Central America because it's the committed efforts 
of both of you, uh, in addition to your work on this subcommittee, but particularly with your leadership uh, at the full committee chairman level, that we'd be able to keep the focus on, or we'd really be in bad shape, probably be gone by now, in the sense of, of what's been happening, not only in Colombia, but uh, Peru and Bolivia and Central America. It was very disturbing to me uh, to hear uh, somehow that we haven't somehow totally wiped out the drug problem is, is grounds for that we should back up. Uh, General McCaffrey frequently compares uh, the drug battle to a cancer. We spent billions in fighting cancer in America, but we haven't stopped cancer. So should we cut all our funding out and give up on fighting breast cancer and other forms of, of cancer in America? It's an absurd argument that we heard uh, just a little while ago. If you want to try to focus on the treatment problem, then focus in addition to the other things on the treatment problem. Congressman Ramstead has an access bill that I'm a co-sponsor of, and we need to move access for drug treatment. Nobody here today is against drug treatment. We have the Safe and Drug-Free Schools bill moving through the committee and many other things that will be in the Labor HHS bill, uh, and, and we're moving those in Congress. We heard earlier we're spending far more on the domestic side than in the targets. But my former uh, uh, boss, uh, former Senator Dan Coates, used to have a story they liked that I'm going to paraphrase here, and that is, is that people, uh, it would be similar to coming up to a river where the babies are drowning, and you're busy pulling these babies out like crazy trying to save their life. And somebody says, I wonder how the babies are getting in here. I wonder what's happening upriver. Well, Columbia is the source at the river. It's coming from Colombia. We're sitting here talking about how we're going to help our communities and how we're going to get the drowning babies out. Well, we ought to look at the source, too, because if we don't get to the source, we can't handle it in Fort Wayne. We can't do enough in our schools. We can't do enough in our streets. We can't build enough prisons because it is a both a supply and a demand problem. One other thing that's really disturbed me, and I was uh, uh, interested if, if Chairman Gilman has any comments on this, too, because you said you'd been in Congress 27 years, and that means at the start you were there as we were coming out of Vietnam. And one thing we seem to be fighting here is this Vietnam phobia that we have in this country of everything, is it like Vietnam, isn't it like Vietnam? And there are several clear things here that are not like Vietnam, in, in my opinion. One is it's, it's in our hemisphere. Columbia is two hours from Miami. This is not something that's overseas or far away. Secondly, it's not Vietnam in the sense that the drugs that are coming in from Colombia are coming into my hometown, into my district, and every other area of America, threatening the lives of all of us in this country. It's not a hypothetical battle, uh, which I felt is important to fight uh, around the world, but it is also one that's of direct clear, compelling national interest in the United States. It's also not Vietnam in the sense that the CNP, as we heard from both your testimony, wants to fight. They are trained to fight. We just aren't giving them the materials with which to fight. And uh, in the military, uh, certainly General Wilhelm on the ground working now, they're trying to clean up what has been a weakened military, but they want to do it and they want to be helped. That is not like Vietnam. But my concern about how it is like Vietnam is, is that we will give them just enough to never quite win, to never quite succeed, and possibly fail. But we'll never give them enough, early enough, to get the jump on those they're fighting. That's the parallel to Vietnam, is, is that we don't have the courage to get in at the front, and then we, in effect, then say, oh, well, they can't win. And I would like to hear, in particular, Chairman Gilman's comment, because you've seen now both ends of this, and it's one of the stories that we're clearly fighting in the media, is, is this turning into another Vietnam, and, oh, we need to back up, and we heard it here just a little bit ago. Well, if I might, Mr. Chairman, just a brief response. Uh, let me note that between 1985 and 1992, with a balanced drug fighting strategy, uh, on both supply and demand at the same time, along with Mrs. Reagan's public relations of just say no, we were able to reduce the monthly cocaine use by 80 percent, which is a demonstration of the fact that by applying an effective strategy, we can make progress. And this is not any time to retreat. We have, as you so forcefully mentioned, a an effective drug fighting force in Colombia that has a w the will and the, the, uh, the wherewithal, the, they lack the wherewithal, the ability to do the job. All they're asking for is some support from our nation. 
So let's give them the support that they need. And uh, General Serrano, who's an outstanding uh, drug fighter, has said that with proper equipment, he could eliminate the cocaine supply and the heroin supply within a two-year period. All we say is then administration people, our DEA and our State Department working together can be a very helpful to him in providing the resources he needs, and we'd eliminate that source. There are other sources, of course, but we must not take from one to give to the other. We have to fight these uh, on several fronts at one time of both reducing demand and reducing supply. And I thank you for your, your supportive remarks. Thanks, and Mr. Chairman, this is a, a, a war in Colombia. We cannot, nor the world cannot, afford to lose whatever it takes. It must be won. It cannot be a narcotic uh, state. I thank uh, the gentleman, and I think we've uh, concluded all of the opening statements. Oh, I'm sorry. I beg, my, beg your pardon. I apologize deeply. Uh, Mr. Osi, the gentleman from California, I didn't see you at the end. Uh, you're recognized. I'm a stealth helicopter down here. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I don't have an opening statement. You're very kind, because uh, we have uh, taken uh, quite some time to hear from these Thank members. You. Thank you, Mr. I Chairman. I would like uh, to excuse our, our witnesses, who are also members of this uh, panel, uh, ask them to join us if they would. And now, uh, if we could call our second uh, panel panelist. Uh, Uh, second panel and uh, only witness on this panel is uh, General Barry R. McCaffrey. And uh, Mr. McCaffrey is the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, he has testified before us uh, before and is back with us. General, you know, I think, uh, the protocol. If you would stand, sir. Your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to provide to the subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? No. Thank you. <clears throat> General, we're not going to run the light on you this morning. You're the only witness on this panel, and I know many are anxious to hear from you, so uh, we welcome you back. Uh, we salute you for. Uh, your efforts, and uh, you are recognized, sir. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you and your uh, colleagues for the uh, chance to come down here and testify. Um, I was able to uh, listen to the uh, opening panels and all your opening comments, and I really must applaud you and the uh, other members of the committee for drawing the attention of the country uh, to what I would characterize as an emergency situation. And I think it's going to require a, a very careful analysis by the administration and the Congress in the coming months to sort out uh, exactly how do we take on these enormous dilemmas that President Pastrana and his colleagues face in confronting uh, a problem of gigantic dimensions that is worsening over time. And specifically, I would say there are three elements of that problem. Uh, the one that very directly affects my own uh, portfolio, of course, is drugs, in which we have seen a doubling of coca production in the last three years. And so poor Colombia, these 36 million uh, very brave people, have now become the number one country on the face of the earth in terms of hectorage under cultivation for cocaine. And indeed, in a very short period of time, have now become uh, has been previously commented on the source of some six metric tons of heroin, uh, drug dimension uh, that is simply astonishing. And I might add it's not just affecting U.S. citizens, this is affecting Colombians, and the drug abuse problem in that country is skyrocketing and it's spilling over into their neighbors. Now, the second problem that Colombia faces, however, needs to be taken into account is a huge economic crisis. It's also clearly linked to the lack of security, which in most ways is fundamentally driven by this explosion of drug production. But we're seeing a 
astonishing 20 percent unemployment rate and 45 percent devaluation of the peso and massive economic flight of investor capital, who in his right mind would invest in Colombia at this moment? And indeed, not just in terms of foreign capital, but domestic also. How can you uh, try and do cattle ranching if you're fearful of uh, leaving the confines of the major cities? Uh, and then finally, as has been accurately pointed out by some of your earlier witnesses, President Pastrana, and I think this is the will of the Colombian people, is trying to bring to an end 40 plus years of the most mindless violence imaginable. And it's a, it's a dynamic process. You know, the FARC and the ELN and the other guerrilla groups originally may have had an ideology and it's uh, it's not clear to most of us that, they're, that they've become anything more than a terrorist organizations uh, which are fueled by hundreds of millions of dollars of drug-created money. You know, I, I heard $1.2 billion mentioned by Chairman Burton. That's the highest number I've heard of. The minimal number is $215 million a year. Uh, clearly, it's resources on a level that have allowed them to uh, have double the number of automatic weapons in a FARC battalion as the Colombian Army, and to pay their, con uh, their narco guerrilla fighters, in some cases, up to $1,000 a month, while the Colombian Army is paying their kids $200 a month. The peace process is an important one, not just to Colombia, but to all of us. It's a regional problem, and it's going to require a very multifaceted approach, clearly one aspect of which may well be enhanced support uh, for the security forces of Colombia. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I have uh, tried to pull together uh, in writing, in a statement, um, our own views, uh, not just of ONDCP, obviously, but those of the Attorney General, Secretary of the Treasury, Defense, uh, and State, and I offer that for the record. And then I put together some charts that I'll run through very quickly that I would uh, with your permission, offer for the record. Without objection, they'll all be made part of the record. Thank you. Uh, if I may, some very quick comments, and uh, I might add that my colleague over here that will be uh, pulling the, uh, uh, the slides for me uh, is an uh, intern working with me, uh, Air Force Second Lieutenant Chris Rainey, on loan for the summer from the JSK uh, School of Public Policy. Uh, there'll be a little bit of flair that may be lacking in my normal presentation. Please, if you will, first view graph. Uh, let me um, just say that uh, the President did dispatch me uh, on a trip uh, last week that took me to Colombia, number one, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Uh, Ecuador to look at the FOL at Monta, Ecuador, to talk to their congressional leadership, their government officials, and the President. Uh, into Venezuela to talk to President Chavez, his defense minister, interior, foreign ministry, and then finally into Curaçao and Aruba to look at the forward operating locations at that, uh, in those two places. Um, I'm very uh, upbeat, to be honest, about the value of our trip and be glad to respond to your own questions. Uh, at the end of this coming month, the President will send me back to Brazil, uh, Bolivia, and Peru and Argentina. Uh, the whole notion to be to pull together regional ideas about continuing to successfully confront uh, the drug issue and to do so not just on the basis of intelligence cooperation and judicial cooperation and air and sea interdiction, which are vitally important, but to see it in the larger context uh, of what we think are the, uh, the major contributions that we, we started in the Santiago Summit of the Americas. How do we make sure that 34 nations are engaged in this process and this is not seen as a U.S. problem that we're cajoling our Latin American partners into participating in? Uh, that's where the trip took me, and uh, I'll be glad to respond to your own interest. Chris, the next chart, if you will, sir. Um, why don't you put them all up there so we can run through this a bit quicker. Uh, Uh, source zone strategy. Uh, six years ago, we put together PDD-14. I think it was a sound piece of work. I, I thought so at the time. 
Uh, it suggests you've got to do it all. You've got to have an, uh, a solid domestic law enforcement and, and interdiction strategy. Yes, you do have to go into the transit zone, the Caribbean, the Eastern Pacific, Central America. We can talk about that. But at the end of the day, the huge payoffs in terms of supply reduction are go where the drugs are produced. And we're doing that worldwide. We're, uh, but certainly when it comes to cocaine and heroin in the Latin American arena, uh, our eradication uh, concept in Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and Mexico are vital to achieving uh, some goal. And I would just suggest to you, almost to my astonishment, it's working. Uh, more so than I could have envisioned in the five some odd years I've been working the issue. Uh, with a rather, in, in terms of the entire national budget, with a rather modest financial investment, uh, we actually have re, re, uh, achieved a net reduction in cocaine in three years. And I'll go on to talk about that and why it might be jeopardized uh, in the coming years. When I say we, this is not just the DEA, the Customs Service, the Border Patrol, the U.S. Armed Forces, the agency. A lot of it's the Peruvian Air Force, the Colombian National Police, uh, the cooperation of authorities in the Caribbean. It's really been a multinational effort, and it's pretty impressive. Next chart, Chris. Um, Don't forget Bolivia. <laughs> Let me talk about Peru, because that's, that's clearly the most dramatic successes we've made. Uh, three years, 56% reduction in coca under cultivation. It's astonishing. Unbelievable what has been achieved. And a lot of that was not just the incredible performance of the U.S. Air Force and intelligence services supporting the Peruvian Air Force. It was an uh, alternative economic development. It was smart political operations by President Fujimori. It was a defeat of the Sendero Luminoso. It was a reintroduction of civilian police into the Wyaga Valley. It was good eradication uh, operations in the Apurimac Valley. But unarguably, that's where they've gone in three years. And for that reason, for the first time in a decade, there have been less cocaine floating around the world on a net basis than there were in previous years. That's jeopardized. We're now seeing possibly some bad evidence of the reintroduction of coca planting into the eradicated fields. Now, a lot of reasons why that may or may not be occurring, one of which is the, uh, as you get production down, the value of the product goes up. More likely, the important reason is uh, these drug criminal organizations are so flexible, they're adapting to what we did, and they're now moving on the rivers, and they're smuggling out in the eastern Pacific by non-commercial shipping. They're getting around what we've achieved. They're out in Brazilian airspace. They're making short aircraft hops across the Colombian border. They're moving paste east into Bolivia instead of uh, north into Colombia. So there's a dynamic process by some very clever and dangerous criminal organizations. Uh, but Peru ought to be proud of what's done. Next uh, chart. Um, Bolivia, um, unusual. I've watched this, as have many of you, for a decade. Um, for seven years, we put a billion dollars in there. We achieved enormous uh, uh, increases in uh, legal cultivation. We uh, helped the police and the Army, but we had a uh, zero impact on coca production. In the last two years, President Bonzer, Vice President Quiroga, uh, this administration has actually reduced coca production 22 percent. And they've done it, thank God, with a human rights equation uh, was taken into account where there has not been massive uh, conflict, armed conflict between the Cocaleros and the police and the army. Now, they ought to be proud of what they've done, but they're also now getting into the heavy lifting, and how well they can proceed will be a challenging uh, concept to them. They've gone out, they've asked the Europeans and their global partner for help, uh, but this is another nation that's been on the right track, and one element of it. Uh, was stiff law enforcement and eradication. Very impressive work. Colombia, a traditional ally. They fought with us in Korea. They are enormously important economic partners, whether it's coffee or flowers or whatever. 
uh, literally 30,000 jobs in Florida, as you well know, Mr. Chairman, depend upon trade with Colombia. Uh, an honest president, a good government struggling with these huge challenges. But when you back off it and look at the uh, global drug threat that they pro pose, uh, it's a huge problem. Now, I might add, Mr. Chairman, I, I would volunteer later on to review the transcript of this hearing. I'll pull together the other actors in the government who watch this issue. Let me try and get you a fact sheet. Congressman Reyes, I think, quite correctly suggested. We got to get on the same set of facts. Um, I think there's been an awful lot of good sound bites uh, that are well-meaning, but, uh, but I need to paint the picture as I think it actually, uh, actually is. Um, I say that because I think Columbia uh, is a dynamic situation. What we've done in the past may not be adequate. We do need to think through the coming several years. It's going to require a coordinated effort under the leadership of Secretary Albright. I went to her when I got back to lay out my own thinking. Uh, she is dispatching Under Secretary Pickering, one of the most distinguished diplomats I've ever worked with. He'll go down there on Monday and try and work the issue. Uh, so it's a changing situation, and, it, and I welcome I think all of us welcome the oversight of Congress and the participation of Congress, but we've got to get in the same sheet of facts. Um, the peace process, the drug issue, the economic problem, they are linked. The peace process is faltering. It's not achieving its purpose. There's been no gesture of goodwill on the part of the uh, FARC guerrillas. It's outrageous. They've gone into this, quote, demilitarized zone, cleared zone, with thousands of FARC fighters. There's 41 airfields in there. There is some indication there is now coca production in there. It is a laboratory operation. They are using it as an armed base area, and during the July offensive, they came out of that DMZ and attacked the police and the Army as far as 75 kilometers away. They executed 30-some-odd people in the DMZ. They are entering homes in the DMZ. 90,000 Colombians live in there. And they're violating Colombian constitutional law uh, by exercising jurisdiction in the absence of Colombian law. Uh, it's a huge problem. And I might add, when they, when they attacked the police and the Army, it was a tremendous signal of determination on the part, not just of General Serrano, uh, but all the Colombian armed forces. Nobody surrendered. None of these besieged outposts uh, gave up. Uh, many of the Colombian soldiers who were killed were executed while wounded. They were shot in the head. Uh, so this is a huge problem. Uh, and yet, in, in saying that, I do not imply that we should do anything but be entirely supportive of continuing to engage on a negotiated, uh, support Pastran and his, his colleagues on a negotiated uh, end of the FARC, ELN, and paramilitary struggle against the government. But that's a problem in some right there, and it's spilling over, as I'll show in a subsequent chart. Next. Um, a lot of us should be proud about what we've done the last three or four years in the Andean Ridge. I'm not sure what's coming up in the next three or four years. It looks to me like the dynamics have shifted, and we're now moving in a different direction. Uh, the proving co cocaine industry is coming back. Uh, it's just beginning in January when we get our uh, year-long analysis of the data, data. I'll be able to give you a better overview, but uh, I think it's going the wrong direction. And I'll try and learn more about that uh, toward the end of the month. Uh, Bolivia. Uh, indeed, we have done uh, a magnificent piece of work, we meaning primarily the Bolivian police and uh, human rights activists and, uh, and uh, alternative economic development programs. Uh, but again, I st think the, uh, the organizations, criminal organizations, have now re-knit themselves. The Colombians are gone. The Colombian criminals are out of Bolivia. But Bolivian cocaine production is still going out of country through Argentina, through Brazil, to Europe. A lot of it's in Europe. It's not going up now into, uh, into Colombia to be uh, turned into HCL. The laboratories are in, are in Bolivia. Uh, so it's a different problem, but and a very serious one, and arguably some tough years are coming up. Uh, and then finally, we talked about Colombia. It doesn't uh, need to be repeated. 
uh, it's not the source of 80 percent of the cocaine. Uh, the facts are uh, that it's a number one cultivation source of coca. And we're seeing an improvement, I might add, in the quality of these coca bushes, the HEL contents going up. It is arguably either 80 percent of the cocaine in America originated in or trans, uh, transited through Colombia is a better way to look at it. I would also argue that there are six metric tons of heroin, high purity, low cost, now being, as Congressman Cummings accurately pointed out, being uh, dealt, uh, distributed by the same criminal organizations that are there to distribute cocaine, which makes it even worse. Uh, that, co uh, that heroin's a new dynamic. It's killing kids from Florida all the way to uh, New York City and Boston. Uh, they're sticking it up their nose, thinking that because they don't inject, inject it, it's less dangerous. Uh, probably, although the extremely good law enforcement work, particularly in Miami and New York City, the seizures are up to 70 percent on, on the East Coast, I would argue that does not necessarily mean that's a primary source of heroin. Uh, poor Colombia produces 4 percent of the world's heroin. The majority of it is still produced in two places, Burma and Afghanistan. And in, one could argue in those two countries, the only thing that works is opium production. Uh, and that stuff's still coming in. Burmese uh, heroin is all over the United States. Uh, next. Um, it, uh, one could argue Columbia is a s trafficking center of gravity, though. There's no question about it. Uh, a lot of the laboratories are, in, are involved there. Uh, the precursor chemicals come into Colombia from, uh, through Venezuela, through Ecuador, directly into uh, Colombia. Uh, the money laundering, a lot of it's either orchestrated or takes place in, in, uh, in Colombian systems. Uh, clearly, the FARC and the ELN and the paramilitary, we've had this long, sterile uh, debate over whether they call them narco guerrillas. I don't know what we ought to call them, but without question, the FARC uh, income depends upon drug production. They're taxing it at every stage. They call it a tax. Uh, the growing of it, the transportation, the laboratories, and so when the Coast Guard and the DEA seized six tons of, of Colombian cocaine, the FARC already got paid. And that's why you see them in shiny uniforms and brand new automatic weapons and with aircraft and helicopters and international legal talent. Uh, it's a center of gravity, we could argue, uh, for a uh, gigantic and menacing uh, criminal enterprise. Next chart. Um, their neighbors are worried. They ought to be worried. Colombia is incapable of controlling the land area, particularly in the south, Cacata and Putabayo provinces. When I flew into the combat base at Tres Esquinas, uh, down right in the heart of, of Indian country, and you look out the window, 30 percent of the land area is coca production. And their, their FARC base area is now operating, and particularly in Ecuador, but also across the border into Peru, uh, into uh, Brazil, uh, the Brazilian frontier, and in, in and out of Venezuelan uh, land space. And then finally, they're clearly across the border into pa Panama on the Darien Peninsula. Uh, I, I mention that not just uh, to indicate the regional nature of the threat, but to underscore the requirement for regional cooperation in solving it, which is one of the reasons I wanted to make sure I'd gone to the surrounding uh, countries and listened to their own views. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, final, um, final quick comment. Uh, we've got a first-rate sink uh, in Southern Command, General Charlie Willem. Uh, the Congress uh, gave us some money to set up uh, U.S. Southern Command in Miami, the crossroads of Latin America. Uh, we got a problem. We've closed down operations in Panama. As you pointed out, some 2,000 counter-drug flights a year, which took place out of Howard Air Force Base. Uh, the capability is gone as of 1 May. It was an $80 million a year operation. There were 2,000 airmen there so that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we were supporting the U.S. Customs Service, which has a, uh, indeed probably the preponderance of counter-drug missions, the U.S. Armed Forces, DEA aircraft, the agency, 
uh, Department of Transportation, the Coast Guard Tracker Aircraft Program, now we're uh, trying to come up with new alternatives. We're behind the ball on it. We kept negotiating with Panama. We thought we had a solution that was good for the region. We got interim access to Monta, Ecuador, Curaçao, and Aruba. Uh, I believe we're, we're going to be able to put together a, a first-rate, longer-term agreement. Uh, there's great receptivity, I think, in the region to continuing uh, these cooperative fights. And I've got to underscore, you know, I was out there at, uh, with <coughs> Congressman Reyes at 2 o'clock in the morning with the Secretary of the Army, the Chief Staff of the Army, uh, the old guard, uh, the soldiers of that M 204th MI battalion to welcome home uh, the first two remains uh, from those five brave young U.S. Army aviators. And the President asked uh, uh, Janet Reno, uh, to head the U.S. delegation that went back to bring in uh, Captain <clears throat> Jennifer Odoms, a beautiful young public servant. Uh, operational aircraft uh, lost, uh, supporting uh, regional counter-drug mission, and in my view, directly protecting the safety of the American people. It was a great honor, I know, for Congressman Reyes and I, among others, uh, to have taken part in that mission. Uh, with your permission, I will end my formal remarks there, and I look forward to responding to your own questions and listening to your own ideas. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'll start with just a couple of questions, if I may. You, you've been quoted uh, as saying the line between counter-narcotics and counter-insurgency in Colombia no longer exists. And uh, I noticed that last week uh, President Pastrana played that down a bit. Uh, uh, do you believe that's a situation and can uh, have your having been there is there any reason that uh, President Pastrana would make those uh, comments well President Pastrana is um, a good man and he's accountable to history for achieving peace in Colombia and to be blunt I'm accountable to the American people uh, to protect them from the drug menace I believe the only way to do that is in cooperation with our regional partners. So it's just a matter of perspective. There is no factual argument that without 25,000 or so FARC, ELN, and paramilitary guerrillas, this gigantic explosion in drug uh, production in Colombia could not exist. And the Colombian police are not capable, with 4,500 members of Dante, in interdicting and interceding in these coca-producing regions. They gotta have the Colombian Armed Forces stand with them. I think it's a, just a difference in perspective and possibly semantics, because he's gotta deal with these people. But there's no, line, uh, no division in your mind between uh, counter-narcotics uh, and counter-insurgency. Well, I don't think I'd go that far. I think there is a distinction, but they're all related issues issues, the spiraling economy, the peace process and the guerrilla violence and the drug issue are all fueled by hundreds of millions of dollars from coca production and opium. Uh, one of the problems that we've had is uh, getting equipment uh, uh, to Colombia. The Congress uh, last year uh, appropriated $280 million and uh, you've heard testimony today about uh, uh, helicopters on uh, tarmacs, uh, equipment uh, not getting there. I met with the Vice President of Columbia, I believe it was last week, when he was in Washington, and we still uh, see me incapable of getting uh, that equipment uh, uh, to that area. Could you tell us of the $280 million that we appropriated, what's there? Let me... Um I think that's one of the areas that bothered me. I, you know, I, obviously, uh, Assistant Secretary Randy Beers and uh, Brian Sheridan and others who are here to testify can, with great, you know, knowledge of the issue, talk to you about it. And I'll, I'd be glad to get you. A Could report. you give us an estimate? Of well, let me, let me, if I can. Our go staff, to our staff yeah. has reviewed it, and they find only a, a few millions of dollars uh, in equip, equipment out of the 280. The press complaint. Uh, continues to report that uh, Colombia is now the third largest recipient of aid, yeah. and actually that's only in the money that's a, uh, appropriated this year, and very few of those dollars uh, are uh, 
investigation Chairman, indicates me, that have can, actually gotten there. Yeah. Rather than go to uh, which four helicopters on which day, uh, let me go to how I've watched it over the last five years. We, for example, a statement made there's no Blackhawks there. It's just simply not the case. Uh, there's seven Blackhawks there in the Army. There's 13 uh, there in the Air Force. Uh, there's six more going in for the police. Uh, they'll be there in uh, October and March. Uh, uh, you know, this best aircraft in the face of the Earth the, is the Black Hawk. It's being modified to reach uh, uh, Serrano's specifications. There are, there, but you, uh, those, there are, if those you seven will, are Mr. with. Chairman, there are six Bell 212 helicopters have been provided to CNP. Uh, only two are currently operating. One was damaged in a hard landing. One destroyed in an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, of the remaining four, two are in maintenance. Uh, there are an additional uh, eight going in pretty darn quick, four more in August, four more in October. Um, the seven are the uh, Hueys are with the military, Blackhawks. Uh, the seven, uh, now there are seven with the Army. Yes. There are 13 with the um, Air Force. There are six more going into the police. Uh, there's an but, Army uh, seventh group the ones we've been trying. Session. But the, 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 the counter-narcotics <laughs> battalion at Tolmida actually is being equipped and trained, and U.S. trainers are there. So I, I, I think it's inaccurate to get the impression that there isn't... Columbia is the third largest recipient of foreign aid in the face of the earth, and there are a lot of people in there trying to make that happen. But, again, only several million dollars, and this recent appropriation that we did in a supplemental was last year. If equipment is actually there, we've been trying to get, again, I quoted Mr. Hafter yeah. from 97 on the Hueys to the Colombian National Police. Mr. Reyes pointed out about the decertification. We could have decertified with a waiver, which we, yeah. which we recommended, which would have allowed us to get that equipment there. So what we have is we've appropriated money, but the, uh, but the actual resources have not gotten to those who are, well, who are conducting that battle. And the dispute in the yeah. Congress or among uh, folks here has been not, get, not providing uh, equip, military equipment to the uh, military, it's, and the military have it. The yeah. police who are uh, conducting the bulk of the anti-narcotics effort uh, don't have it. So it really goes again. Pat, I don't think that's accurate. I mean, when I went to Columbia six months ago, I got aboard Army Blackhawks and flew out to the combat base in Guaviare uh, with NAS-supported helicopters moving Colombian police. I think there's a big problem. Potted radars being produced, Blackhawks being produced and modified. Well, again... And it uh, may, maybe it was inadequately done, but there's a lot of stuff there. There's trainers on the ground. General, we, we you know, we, we just are trying to get that equipment to where it can effectively do the job, solicit your, right. your assistance. Uh, finally, um, uh, one question on the forward operating uh, uh, locations. Our surveillance, which is closed down, and there were 15,000 flights, uh, and... 2,000 personnel, all that stopped in Panama. You had 2,000 flights. Yeah, no, we have 15,000 flights. So. I don't know where you got that. Yeah. We, ought to, we ought to use the same That was facts. the information that we were given as 15. Uh, I, I ran the program. Mm -hmm. 15,000 flights is ludicrous. I don't know where that number came from, but whatever the number okay. is. Right. But we won't debate that. Again, we're using the figures that were given to us by the Southern <laughs> Command and others. In any event, what percentage of flights are now uh, being conducted? We sent staff down there uh, about a month ago, and staff found about one-third of the flights were uh, being conducted that were previously uh, conducted. Uh, and you could give us Manta and also Curacao. Well, you know, that's why you got to be careful what sound bites you use. Uh, the if you take all the flights flown in the region during the month of June, now listen to me, this is factually accurate. It is 122% of the flights flown during the same per, uh, period a year earlier. What's deceptive about that is most of those flights were flown in the, in the transit zone, Caribbean, because we can, 
we can support the Caribbean just as effectively out of Rosie Rhodes, McDill Air Force Base as we could out of Panama. The problem is the source zone region, that's been a huge decrease. But even then, we got into Manta and we got into Curaçao and Aruba and we're flying from all three locations. What, what percentage of flights that we had a well, year? Well, source zone, I think, has gone way down. A part of that, it was tied up in Kosovo. We lost a lot of these Intel aircraft, AWACS, were all redeployed to uh, fight the air war in Kosovo. But, uh, but I think we've got a challenge. We've got to get uh, infrastructure support for Manta, Curaçao, and Aruba. Uh, we've got to get cooperation from regional authorities, or we will have a problem supporting the source zone. You're quite correct. Thank you, General. Uh, just as I conclude, let me submit for the record the helicopter that was shot down in the video was shot down at uh, 1838 to, to, to 1840. It was right at... Uh, uh, at uh, dusk, it was with an infrared uh, camera. Uh, so that's the exact time on that. Uh, Mr. Reyes also asked about a balanced approach. And I'd like to submit for the record these charts which show federal spending on international, which is source country, which was decimated uh, about cut 50% we see during the beginning of this administration. Only now, and if you look here, are we getting back to uh, uh, the equivalent of uh, 1991, 1992 dollars? Uh, federal uh, spending for interdiction uh, was cut, and uh, interdiction decreased uh, 51 percent. Uh, uh, international funding levels fell 56 percent from 1992 to 1995. And for the record, to look at the balance uh, from 1991 to 1999, we've uh, more than doubled, approximately doubled uh, treatment money. Uh, I just wanted to submit those for the record so that we, and possibly there'll be some dispute about these, but we were given these uh, mm -hmm. statistics from GAO uh, reports and yeah. just provide them for the record. Again, trying to create a balanced approach and look at what our strategy should be. I'd like to yield now to, uh, well, I have two of our most ranking members, uh, the chairman of the full committee. Mr. Chairman, would you uh, like to go ahead and recognize one of the Democrats first, and then I'll be. Okay. I'm Does sorry. Mr. Gilman uh, have to leave? I yeah, have. Mr. Chairman, since I have to go on to another briefing, I would welcome if you'd give me the opportunity to just okay ask two brief did, questions. Uh, Mr. Gilman, uh, I, I have absolutely no problem. I want to thank you. And then we'll you. go right back to you. We'll get yes, to and I want to thank okay. Mr. Burton for your uh, courtesy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank our chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. General McCaffrey, uh, we want to commend you for saying what Columbia needs now is a billion-dollar regional proposal. But where uh, is the White House on this? I haven't seen any budgetary requests for that. I haven't seen any spelling out of the details, nor the implementation of your proposal. And we'd welcome hearing about that. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can correct you, I don't have a billion-dollar proposal for Columbia. What I've got is a discussion paper that I put out about three weeks ago <clears throat> to all 14 of the President's Cabinet officers. Uh, it's a billion-dollar package for regional drug issues. And it goes to the uh, Peru, Bolivia, uh, Colombia, the Caribbean, et cetera. And it's not just military and police aid. It's also alternative economic development, support for judicial training and, and infrastructure. Uh, that uh, discussion paper, uh, I think, needs to be addressed. Uh, I was privileged to brief the cabinet uh, very succinctly on uh, our concerns. I've seen the Secretary of State uh, so I, I think we're going to have to look at this very dynamic situation in the coming months. Uh, we've got a challenge on the budget. Uh, there's when, no question. Uh, General McCaffrey, when will we get beyond the discussion stage and just the proposal stage? If we're going to really help, when are we going to provide the kind of funding that's needed and the resources that are yeah. needed? Mr. Chairman, let, let me, if I may, though, challenge all of us because uh, I really welcome your involvement in this thing. We sent over an INL budget. The Senate cut it by 27 percent. Uh, the House just uh, cut the INL budget by uh, 10 percent. Uh, we've got earmarking of money in the House for three A-10 tank-killing aircraft as crop-spraying planes. 
We haven't, you haven't funded the administration oh, General, proposal. If I, might if I might interrupt you, uh, the House and the Senate have complied even uh, with more funding and resources than didn't. the administration requested. Yeah. No, yeah, but, but according to the ON DCP 99 budget summary, 48 million was budgeted for Columbia in fiscal year 98, yet the, the administration only requested 30 million in fiscal year 99. And that represents a 37% decrease in a request in just one year. <clears throat> Why has there been such a significant decrease request? In addition to the 30 million for Columbia in fiscal year 99, Congress passed an emergency supplemental appropriations bill, which brought the total allocations for Columbia last year to about 256 million, according to Owen's DCP figures. Yet, your fiscal year 2000 budget request for Columbia was only $40 million this year. Now you're asking, talking about a $1 billion emergency counter drug, including $600 million for Columbia. So you have now gone from $40 million request to over $600 million in just six months. Why all of these discrepancies? Don't point the figure to the Congress. We're asking the administration, why aren't you coming forward to meet the crisis with a proper funding? Well, um, Mr. Gilman, here's the answer. Uh, FY2000 request for international programs was $637 million. It's a 4% increase over last year's requested amount. And I do think it's an appropriate question to ask, why did the House and the Senate both cut the INL budget we sent over here? I, I don't understand how we can be doing one thing and talking another. I do believe we need a new look well, Gen at the General, region. General, if I might respond, uh, if you, uh, if you let, allow me, me to let answer me respond. Your the Mr. House just passed Mr. two hundred and eighty-five million dollars, which was a request the for INL. Mr. Chairman, you get to ask the questions, but you've got to allow me to respond to them. But your your figures are wrong. We have uh, uh, accommodated the White House request for the funding for INL, well, and we actually, passed it. Actually, Mr. Chairman, the figures are quite correct. Now, I think you're taking a bite out of them, which I believe deserves a respectful response. Uh, but in fact, there's a 4% increase in INL budgets in FY2000, which has not been acted on by the U.S. Congress. Now, I'm also going to propose a new look at the whole region, and I'll get an answer out of the government w when they've sorted out these conflicting peace process economic challenge and drug problems. We are, we do require a new, new look at it, and that's why I welcome your involvement. But I do believe you ought to give us the money that was in the INL budget. That's really what I'm trying to put on the table. General McCaffrey, if we have such a crisis confronting us, why is it the administration asking for additional funds to meet this crisis instead of just a paper talking about some regional approach? Now, let me move to just another area. With regard to Panama and regard to the Howard Air Force Base, we were engaged with the foreign, uh, uh, the foreign affairs director in Panama before we closed the base, and they were anxious to keep us there. And then they got caught up in politics, and now we understand the new president of Panama is willing to discuss further negotiations in keeping Howard Air Force Base instead of advertising Howard Air Force Base for sale to a private uh, uh, developer. And now we're hearing just a recent date that there's an ammunition shortage in Colombia, primarily because the Howard Air Force Base has been closed that used to supply the ammo. And right now they have a critical ammo problem. What I'm asking truly is what can we do to reopen the Howard Air Force Base by negotiations with an administration in Panama that's interested in doing that? Yeah, well, I, uh, I certainly share your dismay that uh, those negotiations didn't come out uh, positively. Uh, we clearly um, were suiting the needs of the region. Uh, it was better for U.S. national interests. It was better for Panama, and I think it's a great disappointment. We negotiated in good faith. Uh, we had a first-rate performance, in my view, uh, by Ambassador McNamara and 
the U.S. ambassador to Panama. Uh, it's a shame that's what happened. Now, in the short run, uh, I think we're out of Panama. I think it's a closed question. The new administration down there, when it gets in office, uh, perhaps then we ought to let them think through what they want to achieve. But I think our sink's got a, a decent way of, of, of dealing with the problem. If we can get into Monta, Ecuador with an FOL, and also into Curaçao and Aruba, and locate a third FOL that can watch the Eastern Pacific, and Panama is not the only option, we will be able to satisfy our regional counter-air requirements. Uh, but, I, but I think President Bayadaris uh, turned off the process until he's out of office and this new administration can look at it. I don't believe it's fruitful to pursue that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General. Thank you. I'd like to recognize now uh, Mr. Cummings from Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, first of all, let me say this, General McCaffrey, I, um, as you know, I really appreciate what you're doing. It seems like it all depends on what day you appear here. Some days we think that you're the greatest thing since ice cream, and other days <laughs> it's like a slam dunk against you. But the fact is, is that I do believe, and I know you know this, that on this day when the Congress is basically out of session for a total of 10 or 12 members to remain here to deal with this issue, it means that all of us are very concerned about this. As I know, you, you share our views and our feelings uh, and our passion about trying to uh, rid our country, if not our world, of, of this drug problem. And, and to, in that light, um, you, you sent a letter, and, I, and I, first of all, let, let's go back to these helicopters, because I mean, we spent a phenomenal amount of time on these helicopters. Um, are you, so, I mean, it sounded as if, and I know we've got some people from state, but you, you, you basically do, I want to first of all figure out what role you play in all of this. I mean, you have a strategy uh, for Colombia, is that right? I mean, pretty much? I think the Colombians have a strategy for Colombia, and we're trying to figure out how to support it effectively. Okay. And these helicopters, uh, you, do you see them as a very important part of uh, the strategy there in Colombia? I think there's no question. Mobility for the police and the Army is probably one of the greatest uh, tools we could give them in the short run. Now, one of the things that you said, and I, and I, uh, you were talking about General Serrano, and you said something that I, that kind of caught my ear. You said something about uh, one of the problems was trying to get helicopters to meet certain specifications of General Serrano. And I know we may have testimony later on about this, but what, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, you know, it's been a, a very complex issue. For example, I probably ought to clear up, and I owe Mr. Burton a response to his very legitimate concern about why would I apparently be supporting the Blackhawks but, but providing a letter to not support the Blackhawks. At one point, a year and a half ago, we, uh, Congress uh, said, let's give six Blackhawks to the Colombian police, but the money was going to come out of the existing INL budget, which to me was a disaster. It would have immediately stopped two-thirds of our support to Bolivia. And so I opposed that course of action. And oh, by the way, the Colombians hadn't budgeted for those Blackhawk flying hours. So they would have stood down, in my view, um, the majority of their Huey helicopters. I said, that's no good, and I wouldn't support it. Uh, Congress last year in the supplemental provided enough money to pay for the training, the op tempo, et cetera at which point I said, okay, uh, it's a contribution. Um, I also would tell you, I think our support for mobility so far has been marginal. Now, this is sort of on the edge. There's 240,000 police and army, 25,000 FARC ELN paramilitary guerrillas, six helicopters. This is not significant. So, so you, but you, you don't have a problem with us getting these helicopters, you're not going to, my time on me, are you, Mr. Chairman? No, I think we absolutely support it. We absolutely support it. I, I thought my chairman was about to stop me, and I just wanted him to know I didn't have my five minutes. Getting, Your right, light's okay, close. Mr. Congressman. I don't know, bud. <laughs> now, let me, let me just finish here. Um, you sent a letter on July 13th to uh, Secretary Albright, 
and you talked about the fact that we had a uh, that the aid to Colombia was quote inadequate to deal with the enormous internal threats and there seems to be some question as to what that was all about and how did you come to this revelation and can you can you address that for us and then you made you had specific requests and well, then we want to know what her response was yeah well i think it's premature to be blunt uh to, that was me laying down a marker suggesting i know there's a for example there's a idea floating around congress or 940 million dollars of support for colombia uh, i tried to pull together some good thinking as a discussion paper uh, not only to sex state but to others involved in this and said let's relook a dynamic situation that's going in the wrong direction and I think that's exactly what's taking place uh, the administration will look through the threat as it's evolved and try and sort out what to do and we'll consult with con Congress but we don't have an idea on the table OMB approved yet to come down here and present to you all right thank you thank you now I'd like to recognize the chairman of the full committee mr. Burton General McCaffrey, uh, according to news accounts yeah, on, in Colombia in 1997, you said you supported Black Hawk helicopters for the Colombian National Police, as you've stated here today. And uh, days later in Washington, D.C., you opposed counter narcotics aid to Colombia, and you wrote that. Uh, Black Hawks would threaten to undermine the objectives of the United States international counter drug policy. Why did you have those two conflicting positions in just such a short period of time? Mr. Burton, I just answered that question. You were involved in the discussion. Let me repeat it, if I may, because I, I think I, it, I, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I just answered the question two minutes ago, but well, let, let me again lay it out. Um, because I think that I do support mobility for the police and the Army. Uh -huh. uh, and th that's unquestioned. What happened was we had a proposal where we would pay for six helicopters for the Colombian police out of the existing INL budget, which would have reduced the Bolivian counter drug aid by two thirds that year. I remember that was a disaster for the U.S. government. So I opposed it. And I provided a letter to that ex uh, effect. Now, later, when we got the supplemental out of Congress, which I think basically is a pretty good piece of work, it was done too hurriedly. It wasn't thought through adequately, but it was a pretty good piece of work. Congress provided the money for the Blackhawks, the training, the spare parts, and the op tempo. If we had taken those six Blackhawks and put them there, minus funding from the Colombian government, I might add, they did not budget for those, the operation of those aircraft. We would have stood down every NAS Huey helicopter. So we, gotta, we can't have, in my view, congressional staffs micromanaging the Colombian police and Air Force. They're not qualified to do it. We ought to make the Colombians think through it, let our sink work with the uh, the people who are doing that, and then present some coherent plan to you, which is what we owe you. G General McCaffrey, it isn't our staff. I talked to General Serrano personally. You know, I looked him in the eye, much closer than we are. He said, why are we being promised these helicopters, and why are they not being delivered? You, you promised 40 helicopters. They're not down there. And you said, well, we, we got to be real careful because we're going to hurt Bolivia if we don't, uh, if, if we take that money away. Right. And, and, and the fact of the matter is we now have a situation that's virtually out of control. And you're saying, okay, now we've got to do something about it. In 1997 and 1998, nothing was done. And Congress, you said that Chairman Gilman and I were micromanaging or trying to micromanage. The fact is we were talking to General Serrano on a frequent basis. We had our staffs going down there on a frequent basis to see what was being done, and nothing, nothing was being done. We got junk helicopters down there. We got 4,000 Colombian National Police being killed. They're, they're now negotiating from a position of weakness with the FARC guerrillas uh, because we haven't done anything. And now all of a sudden, with bravado, you're coming up here saying, oh, yeah, we're going to really sock it to them. We're going to do something. Why didn't we do it before? Well... Um, I would suggest uh, that we, I couldn't agree with you more, we need to relook the, uh, the Colombian problem. Um, I think you're right. 
I look forward to hearing your own ideas. Uh, enormous amounts been done. The, the third largest recipient of U.S. aid in the face of the earth. There's a, a huge embassy and military effort going on to support, where appropriate, training, equipment, intelligence cooperation. Uh, but I welcome your own ideas, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, we, and uh, we'll try and support well, your thinking. We'll, we'll, we'll try to work with you. But let me just say I want to set the record straight on a few issues. The reason we earmark funds for INL is because there are 40 helicopters that have not been delivered. INL has been fully funded, and we're the reason for it here in the House. The Sen uh, we're the reason it's the Senate added that $70 million to INL's budget. Earmarking was necessary to make sure that those helicopters got down there because we didn't think INL This is the FY2000 budget, Mr. Chairman? Because that, that's just F not the F case. FY98. FY98. FY2000, the budget I'm talking about. The one on the well, Hill, the House did not fund it, neither did the Senate. Well, let, me, let me give you the facts as I see them, okay? Right. First, last year after administration cuts in source country programs totaling more than $1 billion in 1993, 1994, 1995, and 1996, Congress acted decisively. Second, Last year, Denny Hastert, the Speaker of the House, led a congressional effort to put $690 million into source country programs as the first year of a three-year effort to fund the Western Hemisphere Drug Elimination Act. Of that amount, and that's the law, uh, but note, uh, very little of that aid is yet in Columbia, that $690 million. Uh, number two, this year, despite all our efforts, despite the U.S. Congress putting forward the crucial three-year Western Hemisphere Act, despite clear signals that will support aid to Columbia, the President asked for zero money for this year's uh, tranche of the Western Hemisphere Drug Elimination Act. We wanted to fund it. We gave $690 million for it. And this year in the President's request, Zippo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh the Chairman of the Full Committee, now pleased to recognize uh, Mr. Reyes. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, General McCaffrey. Uh, I appreciate your, your candor in uh, trying to handle some of, the, uh, some of the questions, because frankly, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of issues that, from my perspective, are up in the air. I, I, would, I would look forward and encourage you to come up with uh, some specific facts that we can, that we can all uh, look at so that we can sort things out because I think ultimately the ones that pay the price are those five uh, soldiers that you and I uh, participated in those in those ceremonies. Uh, uh, part of part of what I think uh, is uh, frustrating, at least for me, uh, is the uh, the fact that we do what I call political jousting in in some of these some of these issues. When we talk about uh, not uh, fully funding the INL money, when we talk about uh, the Senate still not confirming the State Department official in charge of uh, uh, for inter-American relations, when we talk about uh, the kinds of things that we're that we're dealing with uh, as as we try to address drug trafficking on an international level and also on a domestic level, part of the frustration that that I think uh, we all share, regardless of political perspective, uh, has to be uh, a clear understanding of what our strategy is. I think that, uh, and again, predicated on my background and, and, and alluding to the comments uh, of my colleague on the other side of the, of the aisle in this committee, where he was uh, trying to differentiate how this is different from from Vietnam. Well, I would submit that uh, we're engaged, and, and I spent 13 months in Vietnam, and I know you're, a, you're also a veteran of Vietnam. Part of the frustration that I see us participating in and, and fomenting is uh, the fact that we're doing the same kinds of things that occurred in Vietnam, and that's we are interjecting politics when we should be supporting all out an effort uh, that ultimately will will make a difference uh, in keeping narcotics from our neighborhoods and in addressing the issue of uh, how much is coming across the, the border and from where. 
having spent 26 and a half years doing that, of my life doing that, uh, I think it's critical and vital that we work together. I have uh, a couple of questions for you, General, and one of them has to do with the uh, more the domestic, but yet it's related to the international. What is the status on your proposal for the border czar? I, I, think, uh, I think if we're going to be able to have uh, uh, a clear understanding of our strategy, we have to start with, uh, uh, with a strategy that calls for coordination. Uh, when we're talking about our southern border, where, where the challenge is, as far as I'm concerned and based on my experience, uh, we have to be paying attention to coordination. We have to uh, provide the kind of support to our various agencies and our various uh, uh, assets that are involved in this to, uh, to be able to maximize and give them the, the, the best kind of support, both political uh, and, uh, and otherwise. Can you tell me what, what is the status of, the, of your proposal? Um, Mr. Congressman, I think there's some uh, interim good news. Um, there's 15,000 federal agents involved in the defense of the southwest border. Two billion dollar operation. Uh, thanks to bipartisan support in Congress, we have dramatically increased the resources, the manpower of the Border Patrol, uh, the amount of technology going into the Customs Service, uh, the coordination with uh, Mexico, while imperfect, has improved. Uh, the Customs and uh, INL have come up with a notion called BCI a better coordinated action at these uh, 39 ports of entry. Uh, I think arguably our intelligence flow to support law enforcement, federal law enforcement on the border is better. And our HIDA, High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area Program on the five southwest border HIDAs is uh, I think more effective than it was two years ago. At the same time, um, I must admit, I think we need a renewed discussion inside the administration uh, so that there is a better integration of the four major departments of the federal government who work on border issues. Uh, I have argued for a southwest border coordinating official possibly to be co-located at El Paso with EPIC, Joint Task Force 6, and Alliance. And I think there's a strong logic to persuade uh, uh, my colleagues of that, and we need to continue that debate. Thank you, General. And very quickly, can you address uh, the issue of the School of the Americas? We, uh, we fight this battle every year, and uh, it seems to me that uh, the mission of the School of the Americas is critical and vital to the uh, context of the conversation we're having here this morning in this hearing. Um, I wrote some letters over here and I, um, to support the School of the Americas, along with uh, two of the people whose judgment I most trust uh, in government, uh, Mr. Tom Pickering, Mr. Walt Slocum, and State and, and DOD, along with the Secretary of the Army and others. The School of the Americas is an enormous contribution, in my judgment, uh, to allowing, in a Spanish language environment, uh, military and police officials from throughout the 34 democratic nations to come together and train on a common U.S. Army doctrine basis. And I think it's made a tremendous gift of professionalizing and making more responsive to democracy and the rule of law these military forces. It's been going on for essentially since uh, the early 50s. Uh, there were problems with some of the graduates during the ideolog ideological wars of the 70s in Central America and South America, uh, but I think it's a great gift to, to the hemisphere. I also, to be honest, find that the criticism is not only 10 years out of date, it's insulting to the current leadership, uniform leadership, the United States Army. You know, that school at Fort Benning is under the same inspector general rule of law, congressional oversight that any other U.S. Army installation has to respond to. And I, you know, I think the American people properly have a lot of confidence in the, the Army's leadership. So I think we've got uh, an old argument dragging us back to the 70s when we need to look at the future and the School of the Americas as well as the Air Force School in El Paso. If I get it, get it right, El Paso or San Antonio, excuse me, uh, and the Navy's uh, efforts are all tremendous contributions to the drug mission also. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now, recognize our Vice Chairman, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, generally, uh, just you mentioned briefly uh, in your, in your uh, opening remarks about the uh, policies uh, that Peru has implemented, which resulted in a, in a very, very marked decrease uh, in uh, uh, the drugs uh, coming out of that country. Could you just very briefly tell us what is the current status of uh, the Peruvian shoot-down policy? They actually haven't. Uh, I have to be careful and not use classified information in, in public. Uh, the numbers are uh, relevant. Uh, the Peruvians still have a shoot down policy. Uh, their Air Force is still committed. Uh, we're still providing the intelligence. Uh, and basically, it's sort of still working if you look at it from a narrow perspective of air interdiction in the growing fields. The problem is the drug criminals changed their system. So now they're moving short air hops, they're using the river systems, um, and there's, um, there's some argument that, uh, that we're seeing new coca plant, plant, planting occurring in the formerly eradicated areas. Uh, they're also moving out into Brazilian airspace. So, and they're also using ground smuggling out of Peru and into Bolivia. So the, no, I, I understand that, but I, I just wanted to understand, is, is the Peruvian government still have the, the shoot-down policy? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, by the way, I appreciate your comments on the School of the Americas. Uh, I think that was a very unfortunate amount of misinformation that was used in the floor debate, and I, and I hope that uh, you'll be helping us uh, to try and correct that mistake that was made by the House. Uh, with regard to the way we characterize the situation down in, in Colombia, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm glad to see the State Department is now recognizing that it is a narco-terrorist threat or a narco-guerrilla threat, that there is indeed a very, very profound and, and deep relationship between narcotics trafficking and the destabilizing uh, uh, terrorist and guerrilla uh, activity. Uh, I was somewhat, uh, somewhat surprised, though, in, in a recent uh, uh, story to see the, uh, the, the Colombian president denying that the FARC are narco guerrillas. Uh, how would you account for for that? Is, does he just does the president there just not get it? Uh, is does this reflect fear on his part? Uh, some sort of policy decision? I mean, clearly they are narco guerrillas or narco terrorists. Uh, why would the president of Colombia be be hesitant uh, to to recognize that? Well. I I think, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Prestron is trying to achieve peace, and so he's got to deal with these people. He's trying to set up a dialogue. Uh, I'm very respectful of the problems he faces. It, it is not, I presume, it is not the way you would go about negotiating, well, by I, giving, I giving away all of your chips up front. Well, I think uh, I would prefer to not argue about their name and to say that there's no argument that there's $200 million or more going from coca production into the FARC, and that's where the machine guns, the mortars, the legal talent, the corruption, the violence affecting Colombian society and our own is flowing from. Well, I, I, it's not, I don't want to get into an argument because I don't think, I don't think fundamentally you and I disagree on this. Uh, it's not a question of just semantics. It's, it's a recognition of what the problem is. I mean, and his if we, semantics. If, if we have people that say, okay, we have a narcotics problem, let's deal with that, and okay, we have a guerrilla problem, let's deal with that. Uh, we're not recognizing that there is a, a problem here, and the sum of its parts is much worse than the individual parts themselves. Uh, the proposal that, that you circulated in the administration uh, uh, last month on the 13th, uh, the discussion paper uh, recommending a uh, uh, billion dollars in emergency counter-drug budget enhancements, do others in the administration, and specifically, because I agree with you, and I, I want to be very supportive of that, but do others in the administration, including specifically, if you could address this, the President, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, the DCI, and the National Security Advisor, do they share your view that the situation in Colombia is an emergency, and will they be supportive of requesting emergency funds to address it? Uh, I think there's no question that there's a broad-gauged feeling uh, on all my partners that there is an emergency situation. In other words, every, every, I really want to be very specific. Do, do those named individuals, the President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, DCI, and National Security Advisor, 
not generically or as a group, do they share? Because I know you've talked with them about this. They do, do they share, share a your feeling. View? They do share a feeling we have an emergency situation in Colombia, and it requires a broad gauge response, which may require additional resources. Now we've got to sort that out and end up with a sensible plan to send to Congress. Are you, as you sit here today, would you tell us whether you are optimistic or pessimistic that your views will prevail? Well, I'm optimistic that. Uh, I hope they do, but. How do you feel I'm, about I'm optimistic it right now? that the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, uh, Secretary Slater, and others, all of whom have a piece of this, are seriously looking at the issue. We put a tremendous amount of resources in there already, but the dynamics have changed, and now we've got to sort out what do we do to support the peace process, the economy, and the drug effort. Do, do, do you think that, that you will prevail in getting them to agree, not just that there's, okay, there's an emergency down there, but that they will request and support your request for emergency funds? Well, I, I don't want, first of all, there's no request on the table yet. I'm trying to pull together a conceptual agreement among the administration, um, and, and that includes, I might add, I've got to go consult with the leadership in Brazil, uh, Bolivia, and Peru. This is a regional problem, not just a Colombian problem. That's the other thing we've got to remind ourselves. Uh, to, so at the end of the day, I hope that we will continue to evolve a policy that meets the, the, um, uh, the requirements, and it's an emergency requirement. There's no question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Please to recognize now the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. The, um Venezuela is our number one supplier of oil to America, far more than anywhere in the Middle East. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, much of its border, Colombian government now doesn't, in, in fact, c control. Uh, Colombia is the second, I think, in oil byproducts to our country. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your testimony that uh, the problems with pa leaving Panama Canal and that the FARC and the narco traffickers have moved into the Darien. Uh, potentially, in a, with uh, Panama not really having the resources with which to defend itself, we already had the finance people moving in to Panama. Uh, I've heard you testify at multiple different committees on the drug problems in our high schools and all in our cities. There's no question that, that drugs are a, a huge killer in America. Do you believe that the crisis we're currently facing with possibly a destabilization of Colombia or at least a dividing of the country where many of the borders couldn't be controlled is as great a threat to our country as Kosovo? Pretty, I, I very much admired your earlier comment about why this isn't Vietnam. I, you know, I, I think this argument by analogy gets us into trouble. Uh, let me take Kosovo off the table. I, I did that five years ago. Let me, let me, if I can, just get to the part of your concern in Colombia. And I showed a chart that essentially suggests, I think accurately, that if you're looking for the punk of the whole problem, it's Colombia. And it is affecting their international partners. And they're also concerned. Uh, so before we're done with this, it seems to me there, there will be a coming together of these democratic regimes to include us as one of them, with the support, I hope, of the European Union, because we're absolutely going to work uh, other partners to help with this process. Uh, the Brits have been extremely supportive. The Dutch have been supportive. The French. Um, we got to get concerned about it, because it's going to have an impact on many of the rest of us. The reason, uh, because I agree that analogies are, are dangerous, but if we were simultaneously right now funding Vietnam versus uh, Colombia, we actually have to make some very tough budget decisions. And we're looking at putting uh, possibly a minimum of $4 billion to $8 billion into the Balkans. Uh, I wanted to make an earlier comment, which I understand is disputed. Mr. Beers and I have, have argued this uh, uh, before, um, but that uh, let's just say that there's a disagreement in the INL. When I first offered an amendment to move Blackhawks to the CMP many years ago as to whether that money was coming from Bolivia and Peru or whether it was coming because against the will, <clears throat> arguably, of INL and of the Drug Czar's office, uh, resources were transferred to Bosnia at that time. There were multiple ways in the accounting, whether it was a direct transfer or an indirect transfer. 
I in no way, nor did other people, think we were taking it from Bolivia and Peru. Now, we can dispute how the money gets moved around, but in fact, it isn't as simple as it looks just on, on the surface. Furthermore, um, I believe that history, in fact, does matter, uh, not only because um, you don't want to repeat it, but because uh, it's, uh, I know Mr. Reyes and others have expressed concerns about uh, politics, but we're an oversight committee and we have to, to look through and say, well, we've done this uh, and if this didn't happen, how can we not have that repeat again? Uh, that's what an oversight and a reform committee does. Furthermore, I wanted to clarify, uh, uh, and, and I hope in the record of this hearing we can go through and get some of the actual numbers, because we've got numbers passing across each other here. But I do want to uh, uh, clarify a couple of historical points, which really are only minor relative to the problem we're facing now in Colombia, but are uh, important in trying to sort through how we get there. My understanding of the seven Blackhawks with the, the uh, Army and the 13 with the Air Forces, those were not bought with our money. Those were bought for by Colombians. True. And that, and that uh, <coughs> the reason that they were bought by Colombians is because the Leahy rule uh, says that they're, uh, in my opinion, probably correctly for a long period of time, that the Colombian military was not screening their people enough. Therefore, we couldn't provide aid to the Colombian military. The only way we could provide aid was to the Colombian National Police because they had been vetted. And Southcom and General Wilhelm and, and you and others have worked very hard to try to improve the Colombian military. They're trying to get the vetted units, but the only way we could get additional Blackhawks with American funding into a developing crisis was to try to do it through the CNP, not that the Dante were sufficient to, to win a war, yeah. and, and, and we understand that, but that was our only vehicle with which uh, to do so. We're now, uh, to, to add one other thing which I hope we'll, we'll get into in, in these budget questions, the House passed the INL in, in general, and we have upped it. We have had problems in the Senate. We have to work together. Money is $10 million. Uh, and, the, um, and then the sub-questions, um, uh, a second point with that is, is that, as we all know, but very few people want to admit, we are in the process of a very delicate dance about the budget caps. And the, we are in the early stages of a budget agreement, not at the end stages. And that I think anybody will acknowledge that everybody together is going to have to go through. We know we're facing either an omnibus or some kind of combination of omnibus and emergency supplemental. And that's why you're hearing a lot of the questions here today. Will the administration come to the table with an emergency proposal that you're floating, will you put everything in your office behind that? Because we're going to need crisis as the Y2K, as the many other things. Do the Amer and that's partly do the American people understand what we're facing here? And arguing over $10 million when your budget initially was $40 million, I think, and we came in a little under that relating to not uh, $40 million for Colombia, but the, the INL was... Now you're saying maybe $600 million just for Colombia. Hey, conditions have changed. You've said conditions have changed. So what are we going to do to push this up? And, and the history does matter some, but at this point, how do we get to the next level? Well, uh, you can uh, be assured, Mr. Congressman, I agree with your point. I will argue forcefully for a balanced, coherent uh, approach to this changing problem in the region. Mr. Pickering goes down there on Monday. Uh, I believe there is a, uh, a, an enormous focus on the part of all of us uh, that Colombia is going in the wrong direction, and it's affecting our regional partners. And I might add we're concerned about Peru and Bolivia and Panama and many of the Caribbean islands. So we will close on the issue. I will be prepared to discuss uh, rationally our options inside the government, and I'll respond to the Congress in the fall. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Indiana, and I recognize Mr. Osi from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, a couple questions, if I might. If I understand within the budget that you have, you are able to move money back and forth between accounts? I, I apologize. I missed that. If I understand correctly within the budget that you have, you are able administratively to move money between accounts? Uh, there's a legal authority for me to move a percent or so with the concurrence uh, from the smaller of two budgets with the total concurrence of the committee in Congress from which the original budget came. 
Uh, so it's, okay. uh, it's a tenuous authority uh, that exists, and it's never been exercised. One of, the, one of the things I find most troubling about this entire situation is that, and you're, you're far more familiar with the numbers than I am, and uh, I suspect that if we get into an argument on the numbers, I'm going to look pretty foolish and you're going to look pretty smart, and I'm willing to go through that if I have to. But the uh, at some point, I'm reminded of that old ditty that mine is not to question why, mine is but to do or die. And I, I have to say, after seven months up here, I don't care about the next election. I don't care whether I win or lose. I just want to get, I want something to happen. I'm tired of reading about the kids in the streets of America dying from this poison. And I know you are too. I mean, what, we, we moved a half million people and I don't know how much war material is Saudi Arabia in six months' time. And we can't get 10 stinking helicopters to Colombia in three years? I mean, th that's, the, that's the level of my frustration. I'm reminded of General McClellan when he worked for President Lincoln. He had all the rationales for why he couldn't get out in the field and beat Robert E. Lee. How, tell me, give me some guidance here. Well, I certainly agree with you on one thing, Mr. Congressman. We shouldn't argue about facts. I mean, we all learn that, in, you know, logic 101 in college. Don't argue about facts. They either are or they aren't. We ought to argue about the implications of the facts. So I, I think I owe the chairman of the committee some layout so we can have a debate where we all agree on here are the numbers. And, and, if, and if we get down to micro detail on which two helicopters make Mr. Beers and Sheridan answer those questions. I think there's no question of this, though, at all. Four years ago, the counter-drug budget was $13.5 billion. This year, the request on the Hill is $17.8 billion. That includes a 21 percent increase in support for the INL process in that same period of time. 36 percent increase in research, 52 percent increase in prevention education. 26% increase in treatment. There are real people, real programs, real ads, and oh, by the way, there's a real decrease in drug abuse among American adolescents. So you ought to be frustrated, but don't you forget that Congress has provided some serious, sensible increases to support this program, and I'm very well aware of it and supportive of it. When it comes to helicopters and trainers and equipment for the Colombian Armed Forces and police, we've had problems. There are real increases in their capabilities over the last four years. No question. You know, I go down there and I get on Black Hawk helicopters and I visit the uh, Counter Narcotics Battalion in Tolmida, and the 7th Special Forces Group is there, and we're, we're doing the right thing. Now, I think we do. Back to your point. We need a new debate on it because coca production has doubled and they're attacking the police and the army in the outskirts of Bogota and the peace process is not working. Well, well let me, I don't, I don't care about the peace process in Colombia. I just don't care. I don't care. I just want to know when are we going to, as you've suggested, take a material hard look at whether we're succeeding or failure, failing on our, on our standards. Yeah. And just giving General Serrano a couple of helicopters that can get up to the elevations that he needs to go to spray the field seems like an infinitesimally simple thing. And I, I don't understand why we can't do it. Well, why? I think the answer is we are doing it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the answer. There actually are six Black Hawk helicopters that will show up in Colombia. There actually are NAS-supported Hueys. There actually are a brand new intelligence coordination center I was just in. There actually are huge resources flowing into Colombia and they're making a difference. Now we need to revisit, is this adequate? 
not only for Colombia, but for the region. Well, at some point, if it's not, the dilemma we're going to be faced with here is with the FARC growing ever larger and threatening the neighbors and a peace process in shambles or whatever, and the de democratic institutions in these countries collapsing, we're going to have a real hard choice. I'd rather get those helicopters there. Now. If, it's, if it's the helicopters, if it's the physical presence in the air of helicopters spraying coca plants that sends the message or establishes the fact that the FARC's not going to rule here, I, th I just think we ought to set aside. I mean, I've read, I've read General Franks' book. I know your experience in the Second Corps. I know that if there's anybody who can do this, you're the man. And I don't understand why we can't get 10 stinking helicopters to Columbia. I'm completely frustrated. I got kids dying in my district. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, I would like to recognize, as we conclude for a couple of minutes, uh, Mr. Uh, Cummings is serving as their ranking member. Uh, <clears throat> General, um, a few weeks ago, one of uh, my proudest moments in sitting on this subcommittee and on this committee came when we held a hearing with regard to a murderer from, uh, I think it was Florida, Del and Toro. Del Toro, and this guy had uh, eluded uh, extradition to the United States, and they had been trying to get him extradited from Mexico for, like, I think it's something like 18 months, two years, and in one hearing, in a bipartisan way, this subcommittee got it done within about, what, two weeks? two weeks from then. And I think what you're hearing from uh, Congressman Osi and I, I really, and Souter, Souter and all of us, is that, first of all, we acknowledge that you probably have the most difficult job in this country. And, and I don't think anybody here would question that. And I think you're doing a great job. And I think, quietly, others might say the same thing. But. At the same time, when Mr. Burton was questioning you, you said you agreed with him that maybe we need to get together. This is not going to take that long, but to get together to kind of look at our policies with regard to Colombia. And you also said that, and I agree with you, that we have to be careful about the Congress or congressional staff micromanaging what goes on as far as these policies are concerned. And I guess what I, 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 I just come to one basic question, and that is how do we help you accomplish what you have to accomplish? Because I, deep in my heart, I believe that we're pretty, all, uh, pretty much on the same page. We, we, we may have different routes of getting there, but I mean, I can hear the frustration in my colleagues because I feel the same kind of frustration. And I feel, and I also feel the frustration from you. So since we're all trying to get to the same place, I mean, if you don't mind, can you kind of just tell us, and I think Mr. Reyes alluded to the same thing, just, you know, it's not a beat up session, it's how can we work together to be, to take these dollars mm -hmm. that our uh, constituents are paying in taxes and use them effectively and cost efficiently. That, that's basically what I think it would be helpful for us so that we can receive a clear message from you so that when we walk out of here, we, we can say, well, at least we know that the drug czar has come in, he has laid out his problems, and I don't care what anybody says, it is much more complicated, and you've made it clear that it's much more complicated than I, I thought it was. And so now, how do we work with you to make this work. Yeah. Well, Mr. Congressman, first thing, I think the hearing is enormously helpful. I think the process of bringing down the administration officials and asking us where we are and what our evolving thinking is is enormously useful. Um, I think there's a follow-on step to this process that uh, clearly the situation changed. 
Colombia today isn't what it was two years ago. It's my own view. It takes us about three years to see an idea and turn it into money in an appropriations. If you want to build a Black Hawk helicopter and send it to Colombia, it is 25 months to build the thing. They're sitting on it's the best helicopter in the face of the earth. Uh, so it takes time to work these ideas in a coherent fashion. I think we're doing that. If you start looking back at the resources we put into the international piece of it, they've gone up substantially. Uh, it's hard to throw money at Colombia, for example, or even helicopters. Uh, you got to find Colombian pilots to fly them. That's a year of training. And meanwhile, they're fighting for their lives. They're, they're not going to be able to pull people offline. Very complex issue. I think in the fall, uh, I should come back and, and tell you where we've taken our evolving thinking basing on, based on my visits to the region, also Mr. Pickering and others. And uh, let's see where we ought to go from here. Well, I'm, I'm sure the uh, chairman will, I know he'll take you up on that invitation. And, you know, we look forward to uh, continuing to work with you as we address these very, very serious problems. And I thank you for all that you do every day, every hour, uh, to uplift our country and, and the wonderful citizens of this great America. I thank uh, the gentleman recognized uh, for a very brief uh, comments, Mr. Souter. I had a specific comment I want to make, two brief ones, other brief ones as well. First off, I don't know where we'd be, General McCaffrey, if you weren't there, as, uh, drugs are. So whatever criticisms I may have this administration or at times of, of you, I want, to, I want to say that for the record. I've said it before. Uh, but if you were to leave, it would be a tremendous devastation to our country. And if you hadn't been there and using the moral authority and your ability to articulate, we'd be in a, a lot worse shape. Um, I believe we need to move ahead and not look back. I just have to say this for the record. Every time I hear you say about the training time and all that, I'm going, that's why we were pushing this stuff four years ago. Because it, it, if we'd been a little farther ahead of the curve, we wouldn't be potentially quite as bad. It'd still be bad. Um, and I also wanted to say one other thing for record that's not meant as a, as a criticism in any way, and there were, there were lots of, of conflict back and forth, but as a former staffer myself, I want to say a brief word on behalf of staff. Uh, as a, I remember when I was a Senate staffer, we always said the, the scariest thing would, is when somebody comes up and says, my boss was talking to your boss in the elevator. Because the plain truth of the matter is that whenever, whether you're the head of GM or the drugs are, or a member of Congress, we have to raise money, we're going back and forth to vote on the floor. You hire people who become experts in that. The first time I went to Columbia, uh, one of the people we took along with us as an expert was former Ambassador Busby, who had, who had been ambassador to Columbia when uh, what was referred to earlier in, in the court's problem there w was there. Uh, he had been over Latin America issues. We need that expertise. It does not mean that there aren't going to be disagreements. It means ultimately we're elected by the people and we have to make those final decisions. In this area, I've been to Columbia four times. Mr. Micah has been there many times. I, I, Barr spent much of his, his youth there in addition to his trips back. So we're trying to stay engaged, but we also have to have experts on our staff. And I just want to make sure the record reflected that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the only point I wanted to make. Mr. Mr. Sider, if I may, because I, I share your viewpoint. Look, I've never, there are enormously bright, skilled, experienced people in the congressional staffs. I've got about 10 people working for me are the most knowledgeable folks I ever ran into in the government on the, the Andean Ridge problems. But you can't design the Colombian police and Air Force in Washington with anybody's bureaucracy. It's got to be the Colombian authorities, their strategy. They got a budget for it. They've got to, they can't just buy Blackhawks. They got to get the training package, the maintenance package, et cetera. They have to see the trade offs. That's why I've argued push it out, let our ambassador, our sink, and Colombian authorities sort out rational policies, and then we'll decide whether or not to support them. I understand your principle, but remember, in the constitutional powers as the United States was developed, we seek the advice of the administration for how to fund things. But it is the responsibility of Congress 
to ultimately make the funding decisions I, I in the military. Sure. And, and that we're saying because of your expertise, the way the system has evolved is we've gone much more to the executive branch to create offices like drugs right. are because we seek that. But ultimately, we in fact do have to make the funding decisions as American dollars go to Columbia or wherever. And we should be careful not to over micromanage. But when we feel that the, the advisory and execution branch is not following that policy is our constitutional responsibility to do the very thing which is, if necessary, to micromanage. Sure, I understand. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Souter. Being chairman, uh, there is one benefit, and I get to say the last word, uh, General. Uh, we thank you for your testimony uh, today and look forward to cooperating and working with you. Just a couple of things for the record. I had staff check on the number of flights uh, from uh, Howard Air Force Base, and we sent down the Senate uh, Caucus on International Narcotics Staff, Senate Foreign Relations Staff, House International Relations Committee, uh, our subcommittee, other staff. Uh, this is the latest report I have, July 1999. American Facilities, page six within the former Panama Canal Zone, uh, have provided vital counter-narcotics -narc activities, air operations from the base ceased on May 1st, 1999. Before that time, the 8,500-foot Runway saw 15,000 flights annually. The base could handle up to 30 helicopters and over 50 planes. Now, I'm sure that they had various missions, but given 2,000 sure. 2, flights only uh, would have left 40-some planes on the ground uh, each day. I don't think that that was the case. And this may be incorrect. It's just the information that was given sure. to our staff uh, there. Um, sort of a, for, it's a small effort, to be honest. For the, uh, yeah. for, just uh, for the record, uh, we'll, without objection, we'll include uh, that. Um, additionally, uh, you testified uh, that uh, uh, we have had successes in Peru and Bolivia, uh, some of them initiated uh, by the former chair, who is now speaker of, uh, chair of drug policy, and uh, who is now speaker of the House. And I think if we check the record, we'll find we actually spent very few dollars there and have had uh, extremely good return. Peru had a, a very difficult situation with an insurgency problem. Uh, and so it's not dissimilar. It's not totally similar in, in, in any uh, way, but uh, they have been able to do it. And if we checked, it would be with very few dollars from us. And also let the record reflect that uh, the administration did transfer $45 million uh, from that region, uh, the uh, South American region. I remember going down there with Mr. Hastert. We were looking for the money, uh, and uh, they had transferred it to Haiti. Uh, you and you testified to do today, General, that some assets ha had been uh, uh, had been uh, transferred uh, or used in Kosovo, uh, and. Uh, that was an emergency situation. You've also identified emergency situation here. And then finally, an interesting note, we uh, had done some surveillance with you too. We found out when we were down there, we were doing that until the vice president sent the U-2s that were doing drug missions to Alaska to check for oil spills. So we do need to uh, check on what our priorities are and try to get them in order. And, uh, look forward to working uh, with you uh, in a mutual effort to bring this situation under control. We thank you for coming. Uh, we look forward to working with you, and I'll excuse you at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll call uh, our third uh, panel, and I'm going to call uh, forward the Honorable Randy Beers, Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs of the Department of State, the Honorable Brian E. Sheridan, Assistant Secretary of Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict with the Department of Defense, Mr. Uh, William E. Ledwith, uh, Chief of International Operations of the Drug Enforcement Agency, and I'd also ask uh, if we could have Mr. Michael Schiffer join us on this panel. He's a senior fellow and program director of the Inter-American uh, Dialogue.
I'd like to uh, welcome uh, this panel of witnesses. And again, this is an Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee of Congress. Uh, we do swear in our witnesses. Some of you have been before us and some of you haven't. If you would uh, please uh, stand and... Uh, Raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this uh, subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Witnesses answered in the affirmative. Pleased to welcome uh, our uh, panelists. Um, we uh, have gone for some time, and I am going to enter enforce uh, the five-minute rule. We will put on the timer. If you have lengthy statements, uh, we can make them part of the record uh, just upon a request or additional uh, information or data that you think will be of particular uh, importance to the record of this uh, hearing. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome back and recognize uh, you still standing uh, or sitting. Uh, uh, Randy Beers, our Assistant Secretary of the Bureau of International Narcotics uh, and Law Enforcement Affairs of the Department of State. You're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I will make a, a very brief statement, and thank you for uh, accepting our... Randy, uh, if you could pull that as close as possible. That's good. And thank and, you. And we'll make a very, very brief statement uh, uh, in, in opening. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, you have... Uh, as is quite often uh, this committee's uh, role uh, brought us together on an absolutely critical issue uh, that we are facing at this time, and we uh, all appreciate that. I, I echo uh, General McCaffrey's uh, statement in that regard. Uh, let me say uh, also that uh, General McCaffrey, I think, has done a, a fairly respectable job in his opening statement of covering most of the material uh, that I, I will want to cover. And uh, I, I wish only to say that uh, uh, the State Department uh, and INL in particular uh, are committed uh, to dealing with uh, the problem in Colombia, uh, to going after drug traffickers uh, in both the areas of cocaine and heroin. Uh, and I look forward to your questions and an opportunity to explain some of the questions which you all have raised uh, in your own opening statements. Thank you. Mr. Beers, that's probably the shortest statement uh, made by any official of the State Department uh, in history. Uh, well, we welcome it in a way, but uh, we'll be back for questions uh, after we hear from uh, Brian E. Sheridan, Assistant Secretary special for se Special Operations in Low-Intensity Conflict uh, with our Department of Defense. You're welcome and recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm also very pleased to be here today uh, to discuss the situation in Colombia. I think we all share the committee's concern about uh, recent events there. In your letter uh, inviting me to come today, uh, you asked four questions. I would like to very briefly uh, address those uh, in a written form submitted to the committee or fuller responses, but I would like to highlight a couple key points. Uh, you asked about the nature of the drug threat in Colombia. Uh, to us, we still see Colombia as the source of over 80 percent of cocaine hydrochloride uh, uh, production. We see recently increased fragmentation in the business, an explosion in cultivation, a continued heavy reliance on aircraft for internal flights by drug traffickers within Colombia, and what in our view is an increased kind of intermingling or blurring between the FARC and drug traffickers. Secondly, you asked what are recent initiatives of the government of Colombia to address this threat. I can only speak to the ones that the Department of Defense is involved in. Um, and as for recent initiatives, we're working with them on the counter-narcotics battalion, enhancing their air programs and enhancing their riverine programs. Uh, and then lastly, you asked about the regional security implications. And for that, I would simply say they are serious today and potentially more serious as time goes on. If I could uh, close, I, I would like to, to make one pitch uh, to the committee uh, for support going forward on keeping open the School of the Americas. Uh, Congressman Ray has raised that a few moments ago, and I think General McCaffrey uh, spoke of the importance of the school. 
Uh, I think at a time when we're studying the situation in Colombia and are concerned about it, it's worth noting that over the last five years, 789 Colombian and police and military have attended the School of the Americas. And uh, from a regional perspective, 310 Bolivians, 116 Ecuadorians, 222 Peruvians, and 177 Venezuelans. So from a Department of Defense perspective, the School of the Americas plays a vital role in our engagement in the region and in running good sound counter-narcotics programs. Uh, with that, I will conclude my statement, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you, and uh, would like to now recognize Mr. William E. Uh, Ledwith, uh, who is the Chief of International Operations with uh, DEA. Welcome, and you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for providing DEA the opportunity to testify at this very important hearing. If I may, we have a short oral statement, and then I would request that our full written statement be submitted. Without objection, your entire statement will be made part of the record. <clears throat> Chairman Miker and members of the committee, DEA believes that the international trafficking organizations based in Colombia who smuggle their drugs into our country are indeed a threat to the national security of the United States. As a law enforcement agency, DEA must hold to a high standard of evidence. Our investigations aim to gather evidence sufficient to indict, arrest, and convict criminals. Our evidence must be usable in a court of law and must withstand severe scrutiny at every level of the criminal justice process. With that in mind, my testimony will be limited to presenting the evidence that DEA holds and drawing conclusions which we can support, given the legal standards with which we must meet. Colombian traffickers control the vast majority of cocaine in South America, and their fingerprints are on virtually every kilogram of cocaine sold in U.S. cities and towns. In addition, Colombia alone now manufactures a minimum of 165 metric tons of cocaine hydrochloride directly from Colombian-grown coca leaf with an almost equal amount being manufactured or controlled by Colombians from Peruvian-Bolivian cocaine base. Colombian traffickers are becoming increasingly less reliant on Peruvian and Bolivian cocaine base. As many of you are aware, and as DEA has testified to in the past, the U.S. is currently experiencing a significant cocaine and heroin trade on the East Coast U.S franchising a significant portion of their wholesale heroin and cocaine operations is allowing the top-level Colombians to remain beyond the reach of American justice. The Dominicans in the U.S., and now not the Colombians, are the ones subject to arrest, while the top-level Colombians control the organizations from outside the United States. This change in operation succeeds in reducing the Colombian criminal's exposure to U.S. law enforcement and extradition to the United States. Reducing their exposure puts the Colombian bosses closer to their goal of operating from a political, legal, and electronic sanctuary. In addition to the Colombian organized crime groups involved in the international drug trade, there is another interest issue of great importance both to the United States and to Colombia. There is deep concern about the connection between the FARC and other terrorist groups and right-wing groups in Colombia and the drug trade. The Colombian government is responding to this armed challenge. DEA has in the past demonstrated its ability and willingness to fight drug trafficking organizations on a global basis. For example, we participated in the struggle against Pablo Escobar in Colombia, a trafficker who resorted to extreme acts of violence as the net was closing around him. We will work to indict and bring to justice any drug trafficker regardless of his or her associations. An alliance of convenience between guerrillas and traffickers is nothing new. Since the 1970s, drug traffickers based in Colombia have made temporary alliances of convenience with guerrillas and right-wing groups to secure protection for their drug interests. DEA intelligence indicates that many elements of the FARC and the ELN raise funds through extortion, taxation, or by directly selling security, security services to traffickers. These terrorists extort from all manner of economic activity in the areas in which they operate. In return, the terrorists protect cocaine laboratories, drug crops, 
clandestine airstrips, and other drug interests. However, these terrorists are not the glue that holds the drug trade together. If the traffickers did not buy security from the FARC or ELN, they would certainly buy it from elsewhere, as they have done in the past. It is, however, true that the cash cow represented by the drug trade has taken on a major role in financing the terrorists. The physical threat posed by the terrorists is very real. The frequent ground fire sustained by CNP aircraft when engaged in eradication missions over FARC or ELN-controlled areas is indicative of the extent to which the terrorists will go to protect the drug interests. DEA's partner in Colombia, the Colombian National Police, is a major law enforcement organization with a long and honored tradition of professionalism and sacrifice. The CNP is aggressively pursuing significant counter-drug operations against cocaine processing laboratories, transportation networks, and trafficker command and control elements. By way of conclusion, we can and should continue to identify and build cases against the leaders of the criminal groups from Colombia. A number of initiatives hold particular promise for success. DEA is fully committed to supporting efforts currently underway to train and equip effective forces within the Colombian military to counter the narco-terrorist threat. The excellent working relationships DEA enjoys with the Departments of State and Defense on counter-drug issues will provide a foundation for sustained cooperative effort in these undertakings. The U.S. Embassy's Information Analysis and Operations Center will be increasingly utilized to coordinate and analyze tactical information regarding the transportation and product production activities of drug trafficking groups active in the Colombian territories south and east of the Andes Mountains. The Special Investigative Unit programs funded under the Andean Ridge Initiative will continue to work closely with DEA and conduct high-level drug investigations against the most significant violators. The CNP, in concert with DEA and other law enforcement agencies, is conducting several sophisticated investigations, which we, will be we believe will lead to the dismantling of major portions of the most significant drug trafficking organizations currently operating in Colombia. The DEA will continue to work with our partners in Colombia to improve our cooperative efforts against all those involved in drug trafficking. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today, and I will be happy to respond to any questions you may have, sir. Thank you. With, withhold uh, questions until we hear from Michael uh, Schiffer, who is a senior fellow and program director at the Inter-American Dialogue. Welcome. You're recognized, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the uh, subcommittee's invitation to testify at this very important and timely hearing. Just a year ago, I had an opportunity to testify before the subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere on the political and security situation in Colombia. They said they don't need the interview. The, the main point I want to convey today is the following. The goal of the United States should be to help improve the Colombian government's capabilities and effectiveness. We should help the government reach a political solution to the country's intense conflict from a, from a position of strength. We are currently not doing all we can to advance this goal. Contra Colombia desperately needs political reconciliation. This is the first and critical step in what will inevitably be a long-term process. The ultimate aim is to construct a more inclusive society and more effective institutions. President Pastrana along with most Colombians, instinctively understand this. It is hard to imagine a successful effort to fight drug production and trafficking without a strong and stable Colombian government. It is crucial to first establish a greater measure of authority and control over the forces in conflict. For Colombians, this is the priority. The Pastrana government faces two fundamental challenges. The first is to devise a clear and comprehensive strategy to help Colombia move towards greater reconciliation. The second is to forge a national consensus behind such a strategy. The strategy should attempt to do two, three things. Set firm goals, spell out what the Colombian government is prepared and not to, prepared to accept in any negotiations, and organize resources accordingly. Colombians will have to work out the details of such a strategy and assume responsibility 
for carrying it out. The strategy will no doubt include many aspects. These may range from economic support to help with mediation efforts, from development assistance to the strengthening and professionalization of the military. The United States can and should help Colombia deal with its difficult challenges. We have many reasons to be interested in what happens in Colombia and to do what we can to contribute to a more prosperous, stable, and democratic country. This means engaging with the Pastrana government in the most respectful and constructive way. It also means consulting widely among our hemispheric neighbors and other friends to mobilize and sustain adequate backing for President Pastrana's approach. It is crucial, however, that the support provided by the United States or the international community be consistent with and help reinforce the strategic purposes set by the Pastrana government. It, it is not surprising that's, that some U.S. officials are edging towards greater support for Colombia's security forces. The key question, however, is what the United States realistically expects to accomplish with such support. Is it, in fact, the purpose of U.S. Colombia policy to defeat the guerrillas? Is it to reduce drug production? Or is it to enhance the Colombian government's leverage to negotiate peace with the insurgents? For many, the answer is simple, all of the above. They regard the guerrillas and those involved in the drug trade, producers and traffickers alike, as virtually indistinguishable. These groups are, in fact, connected, interconnected in complex ways, but they are distinct and ought to, be, ought to be understood as such. No one disputes that the guerrillas, the insurgents, draw substantially uh, from the drug economy uh, for their strength. Important consequences flow from failing to distinguish between guerrillas on the one hand, drug producers and traffickers on the other. For one, the trade-offs among different policy aims tend to be ignored. We should realize that not all objectives have equal weight and not all policies can be pursued at the same time. That is why we should keep our main objective, improving the Colombian government's capabilities in sharp focus. Achieving peace with the guerrillas and reducing drug production will come about only as a consequence of that improvement. What is crucial is to face squarely what military aid to Colombia actually means. Should the United States make defeating the guerrillas its main goal? If so, how much would that cost and how long would it take? Once undertaken, how far is the United States prepared to go? The Colombian situation has all of the elements of a slippery slope or mission creep. But military assistance is, at best, only part of what needs to be a comprehensive approach to help Colombia deal with its underlying problems. That is why a wide-ranging program of reform and reconciliation in Colombia is so essential. Increased U.S. support for supporting the Colombian armed forces should be seriously considered. But that step should be an appendage of a broader strategy designed to strengthen democratic institutions and attain political reconciliation. Too often, pursuing peace and supporting the military are regarded as mutually exclusive. They should not be. The false and dichotomy only further polarizes the already difficult politics of Colombia's peace effort. As I mentioned at the outset, the fundamental goal of the United States should be to help improve the Colombian government's capabilities and effectiveness to enable it to negotiate from strength. This is the best way we can contribute to the kind of profound institutional change Colombians desperately want and deserve. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Beers, uh, as my dentist said before, he was going to take out my wisdom teeth. I'll try to make this as quick and painless as possible. Uh, no, you're, uh, I intend in not reading a longer statement. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Well, I think you see sort of unanimous consent that we want the equipment to get there. The Congress has appropriated a significant amount of money, uh, and we keep hearing it over and over. We're now, it's now the third largest recipient of uh, foreign aid, but the equipment isn't getting there. And we, we still have uh, four upgraded Huey-2 helicopters sitting on the tarmac uh, in Ozark, Alabama, uh, waiting to be shipped. Uh, Mr. Burton, the chairman of the committee, went through a, a litany of um, delays that we've had. Can you tell us where we are? What's our hope of getting these there in the latest timetable? Yes, sir, I can. Um, we, uh, with respect to the 10 Huey 
helicopters that were being upgraded to the Huey 2 configuration. Uh, we began the contracting uh, in March of last year. Uh, the delivery of the kits, that is the portion of the uh, plane that has to be installed in the older helicopter in order to bring it up, uh, were delivered uh, according to uh, a schedule uh, that had been uh, proposed by Bell Helicopter. Uh, those kits began arriving uh, in their full form uh, in November of last year. Uh, there were some delays in some portions of those kits, uh, which, did, which, which caused them all not to arrive on the original <coughs> schedule. Uh, there was uh, also a misestimate uh, with respect to the amount of time with which it would take to actually bring the helicopters uh, into the configuration required. That is a combination both of taking older helicopters, which they were, and bringing them up uh, to full capability, and then also installing the kits. So there was a delay uh, which resulted there. Uh, and thirdly, uh, there was some additional requirements that were uh, uh, requested by the Colombian National Police after the first two uh, helicopters were supplied uh, in the February time frame, uh, which added some time uh, to uh, submitting the design specifications and adding that equipment. That amounted to uh, what is uh, for you and for me uh, a delay which is far too long. But they're on the tarmac But they are now. now on the tarmac. The first of the four was received in June for transportation. The second two were received after the middle of July. And when? And the fourth, the fourth uh, is uh, in receipt now. We contracted for the plane uh, after we had the, the three, uh, the Air Force provided oh, us uh, with transportation uh, free of charge uh, for next week. And that is the reason okay. that well, that's there what are I was trying to get to. Four, now four next ready week. To go. Okay, and today. We don't ship normally smaller amounts. August 6th, though, five. they'll be there by next Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. Four the more. next yes, question sir. would be uh, Congress uh, also authorized and appropriated money last year for six Black Hawk helicopters for the Com Columbia National uh, Police. To date, how many of these helicopters have been delivered are actually in Columbia? Uh, sir, there are no Black Hawk helicopters in Columbia at this particular point in time. The money was made available uh, for signing contracts in February of this year. The contracts were signed immediately. The Army uh, allowed us to uh, move to the front of the line to take Black Hawk helicopters uh, for this particular project. The uh, specifications had been agreed upon during the time frame from the passage of the Western Hemisphere Drug Elimination Act until the funds were uh, provided to us in final form. Uh, so there was no delay with respect to that. Uh, the uh, <laughs> So the helicopters, we, we will have three of them that will be delivered in November and three more which will be delivered in March with pilots, mechanics, and spares so that they will all be ready. The Colombian National Police had neither the pilots nor the spares uh, available uh, at the time. Uh, they chose not to train on helicopters other than the ones which they had ordered mm -hmm. so that a possible uh, speeding up of the aircraft delivery time with pilots might uh, have been possible. That's their choice, uh, and that's the delivery schedule. Mr. Sir. Beers, one of the latest rumors to float is that now the lawyers in the State Department have suggested the need for an export license to transfer the Black Hawk helicopters to Columbia. Uh, is, that, uh, is that the case? Uh, have you heard uh, that that may be required? Uh, no, sir, I have not heard that that may be required. All right. and, uh, but we will comply with the law. All right. We um, also lost uh, one aircraft, an ARL, uh, Airborne Reconnaissance uh, Low uh, plane. Uh, and I think that there have been uh, listed as requirements that we may need as many as 15. 
uh, we've lost one, and the cost of those around $30 million apiece, Mr. Sheridan, is there, uh, uh, is there going to be a supplemental request uh, for uh, this equipment? Um, <clears throat> At this time, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure. Certainly, we have been in discussion with uh, General McCaffrey's office uh, about uh, a possible supplemental and what it would look like. Within the department, we're certainly looking at the various programs that would make uh, good candidates for such a list. Obviously, with the loss of the ARL, that, that would be a logical candidate, but uh, it's pretty Mr. early. Mr. Uh, uh, Barr asked uh, the question, about uh, if the administration was preparing a um, supplemental, emergency supplemental request um, and he named some agencies. Is your agency working with either the drugs or, the, or anyone else in the administration to come up with numbers to present to uh, Congress uh, for uh, an, a, a new supplemental request or emergency sup supplemental? Yeah, um I have to be uh, careful, Mr. Chairman, because I'm not a comptroller uh, type, and I don't know what form it will, uh, such a thing, if it comes to pass, it would eventually take. But I know we are, we are looking at programs right now. We are working with our comptroller. They are in discussions with OMB, but it is, it's very, very early in that kind of process, and, and how that all ends up playing out is above my pay grade. But we and are Mr. Certainly Beers, looking at you it. are working on a, a part of that request with the drug czar? We are, sir. And uh, Mr. Ledwith, are you involved? Have they asked DEA uh, no the figures? Sir, I'm not personally involved, but I am aware that those discussions are underway mm -hmm. at the more senior levels of our agency and Department of Justice. Uh, finally, Mr. Beers, do you have any idea when uh, the agency or uh, the drugs are might be coming back to Congress with a supplemental request? Uh, sir, I can't say with. Uh, precision when it will be uh, uh, that 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 will be ready. I I just don't know. Although I, I think Congressman Souter probably provided us with the most accurate expression of how this is all going to take place when he spoke about uh, a mid-September time frame. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cummings. You're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, if I were, if I were uh, just uh, one of the many people watching this right now on C-SPAN, I think I'd be a bit frustrated um, when we think about sending a space capsule all around the, uh, I mean, in outer space and then get it to land at a precise moment in a precise place and I don't know that much about the military but and then they sit here and they hear all the difficulties that we're having with these Black Hawk hel helicopters and the Hueys I tell you it I'm sure it gets kind of frustrating to them and I'm sure they're sitting there right now just kind of scratching their heads and there's some of them that are sitting in my district probably looking out a window right now as drug deals are taking place and they're trying to put the two together. One of the biggest complaints I get in my district is that drugs are flowing in but the people in my district own no planes, they own no ships, no trains, no buses and they're coming from somewhere. And so when they hear this and when I go back and I say to them this afternoon I'll be back there in about an hour or two and they'll say, we saw you on C-SPAN, and you see, I told you. I told you that we should be doing a better job, and I heard what they said about those Black Hawk helicopters, and see Mr. Cummings, um, and, and see, they, they have become very cynical, and they believe that the government, in some instances, is almost a part of allowing this these drugs are coming down into, into their communities. With that statement, let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Beers. The, you told us a moment ago that, uh, I th now correct me if I'm wrong, that we'll have three Blackhawks in November and three more in March, is that right? That's, that's correct, sir. And um, 
you know, as you were going down the list of the problems with the hearings, you said three things that I have listed here. You said there were delays, there was a misestimate, and then there were additional requirements. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how, I mean, how do we, what happens to us here is we get a little frustrated because we come back and, I mean, how do we know we're not going to hear the same excuses over and over again? And I don't know whether you heard Mr. Osi's uh, comments a little bit earlier about his frustration, uh, because I'll tell you, um, I think we're sort of, we're in pretty much agreement on this. We want to see things happen, and this is already a slow process up here, but we do like to see things happen because people are dying as we speak. People are getting addicted as we argue. So I'm just trying to, can you give us some assurances um, so that we, you know, I always say that a lot of times what happens is that people get caught up in motion, commotion, and emotion and no results. And so the question is, is whether in, when the time comes in November, how can we be assured that these Black Hawk helicopters are going to be where they're supposed to be, doing what they're supposed to do, so that people watching this and the Congress uh, can have the kind of faith and confidence that they need. Can you understand the frustration, too? Sir, thank you for the opportunity to respond. I answered the questions which were asked me. Let me give you the answer now that tells the picture of the entire story. We have focused on the delivery of some helicopters, and they are important, and I don't mean to diminish that. Last year, INL and the Colombian National Police sprayed 66,000 hectares of coca in Colombia. We sprayed 3,000 hectares of opium poppy in Colombia. This year to date, we have sprayed 7,500 hectares of opium poppy, and we have sprayed 27,000 500 hectares of coca. That is the effort that INL and the Colombian National Police make together. In addition to that, we have raided labs. The Colombian National Police captured approximately 30 metric tons of cocaine last year, and they are on a similar pace this year. There has been no delay, no delay in the prosecution of the campaign against opium poppy for lack of helicopters. We began that campaign in earnest this fall, and we have not had one day that we didn't fly because those helicopters weren't there. There are adequate helicopters that are there. They are flying when they can fly because of the weather. You know. But we are still continuing to make that effort. These helicopters will help expand that effort, but we also have other needs. What we do with most of our money, what we do with most of our support, is provide assistance to the Colombian National Police and their air wing to keep their planes and our planes in the air. These will be additional planes. They will help. But there's been an effort that's been ongoing uh, throughout this period of time. I want these new helicopters to get there as quickly as possible. But we will go with what we have when we have it, and we will continue to make a significant effort, sir. I am so glad that I asked you that question so that you could say what you just said. I mean, we need to hear that. The American people need to hear that. And I'm glad you said it the way you said it. And I really mean that. Um, because those are the kinds of things that we need to know. And I agree with you after you said what you just said, that maybe, maybe we are putting too much of a spotlight on one thing and not dealing with all the other good things that are happening. Now I feel a little bit better about going back to my district this afternoon. And I can, I'm sure they'll quote, quote you. They'll probably even remember your name. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank the uh, gentleman recognized now, Mr. Souter, the gentleman from Indiana. So nobody thinks that we just do this to have a public debate for television. We've argued in hotel lobbies in Santiago at the Summit of Americas. We've argued in yes, back sir. rooms. Uh, that, um, and uh, I have a, uh, I mean, I want to plunge into some of the, the particulars. Um, 
and some clarifications, but I have a, a couple of particular questions that I, I, I want to clarify. Um, are the helicopters to Columbia the top priority? In other words, are they designated what I understand as an FAD, Force Activity Designator, so it's the top priority in getting military equipment over places like Chile, Argentina, or other places where we're not at war? Is it the top priority? We have requested that of the Department of Defense. We have not yet received an answer from that, sir. But with respect to the helicopters themselves, with respect to INL's effort, they are our top priority at this point in time in terms of the delivery of product here that needs to be down there. When did the request go to the Department of Defense? In June. And Mr. Sheridan, do you know why that hasn't been uh, acted on? For airlift? No, it's for the uh, priority on the spares in terms of the buy. <coughs> um, this would be a thing. Yeah. Congressman, I'll have to get back to you on that. I, I will check Priorities. it. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, but I mean, it's, it, this is, um, I mean, this isn't years at least, it's months, but when there is a war going on and, and we heard about the nature of the crisis, I would hope that we could move as fast as we seem to in other areas of the world where we may not have the same compelling national interest, which was an editorial comment, I realized. Um, another, um, another very specific question, we have really, um, uh, struggled with the Leahy Amendment and how to work with the applications of Leahy Amendment. And my understanding is, is that there was a allegation of a human rights violation lodged against a senior officer of a brigade-sized Colombian unit that have res the result of blocking any U.S. assistance to that brigade. And that uh, Colombia has very few brigade-sized units which are capable of conducting offensive operations. So the strict interpretation of the Leahy Amendment has resulted in weakening, weakening their ability and our ability to do that. Would you have the State Department's legal advisor provide this committee with some detailed recommendations in legislative language to address the current limitations imposed by the Leahy Amendment? Because we have some belief that, that they are willing to kind of work with this too. Uh, that part of the problem here, and I have directly talked to their uh, defense minister, ministers and military commanders too, as have many others, and they are trying to vet the units. And in fact, we, ha we have said that we, we want to be so careful that even when there's a complaint lodged, but if a complaint is lodged, are there ways we can get the individual uh, separated so you don't, in effect, shut down a whole brigade because of a, a complaint lodged against one individual? Because if we are in the nature of the crisis that we've heard about today, this is, is really micromanaging to the detriment of not only the United States and Colombia, but the entire world as we hear it's going to Europe and everywhere else. Sir, I will take that question back and, and, and we will provide you an answer in that regard. But let me say, uh, on behalf of the Colombian government and our effort to deal with this issue to date, uh, part of the reason that you all are hearing about this counter-narcotics battalion which is being established now is a realization on the part of the government of Colombia in conjunction with consultations with us to rebuild units in order that these issues are not relevant to the discussion of assistance to those kinds of units. And that is, I think, a valuable and important move on the part of the government of Colombia that will, uh, even without any change in legislative language, make this process a lot simpler uh, in terms of our ability uh, to certify that the units are uh, eligible for assistance and to maintain uh, constant oversight of that as the legislation requires us to do. Uh, another question I have is, is that regarding these counter-drug battalions, um, it is my understanding that they're to be activated in December, that there is no particular budget for air mo mobility for these units. Um, I would hope that any supplemental request that comes up or emergency request would address this question. We have worked for years. I, I would argue we're at least three years behind where we wanted the Blackhawks into the CNP, and I'm very concerned that those are going to be diverted into this other important battalion, which is, I'm not arguing against it, because you have to have both fighting, but we had a specific intent of Congress, and we want to make sure on the record that there's an understanding that there needs to be a budget for this battalion if, if we're going to do that, not transferring what we committed to the CNP. Sir, I can assure you that the Blackhawks that you all asked to be provided to the CNP will be provided to the CNP, and the ones that have come off the line will be the ones that will be provided. There will be no substitute or any delay caused by any displacement for another requirement. Let me 
uh, indicate to you that, that uh, with respect to the issue of the mobility of the counter-narcotics battalion and the counter-narcotics effort on the part of the Colombian military that we have proposed to them and they have accepted and we are in the process now of working through the details uh, and interim uh, lift capability, which will involve the provision of certain uh, helicopters that are uh, within the INL inventory to give them uh, an interim lift capability uh, until such time uh, as they uh, have the Blackhawks that they would like. So we will be doing our part uh, with respect to assets that are already within INL's control in order to make sure that this battalion is in a position to move as soon as they're through with their training. Because as General McCaffrey said, if you wanted to buy a Black Hawk today and you put your money on the table, absent any other provisions, you have to wait 25 months before that Black Hawk comes off the line and is available. And I would again hasten to point out that I agree with that point, which is why we started this process four years ago. I am not one who uh, is going to take that real lightly because we, we, if we would have started this process, we would now be talking about how we w would be addressing the full. Uh, uh, and and uh, my ability to have the aircraft in order to provide the interim lift capability is a direct result of you and your committees and this Congress's efforts to provide us with the resources, and we appreciate that very much. Now, I, I would like to move, and I know Chairman Gilman came in, so I'll try to uh, appreciate giving me ex extra time here. To the, to the, uh, you made some comments earlier that I that I want to clarify because and try to put this in context briefly, or we're going to get really arcane real fast. Uh, uh, as we've argued over even the guns and the bullets in the in the different helicopters we're sending down, uh, the, in the cost of the bullets, I should say, as to which gun we were going to do. Um, that first off, that I think. There's no disagreement with your earlier point in response to Mr. Cummings that nobody should think that we've stopped efforts anywhere along the line and that the State Department and the Colombian National Police and the Colombian government have been aggressive in trying to do what they can with the resources that they have. Um, however, we also heard earlier today that this has exploded in Colombia and clearly those resources are not sufficient and that um, uh, as we were squeezing particularly with President Fujimora in Peru and in President Banzar in Bolivia, we in fact moved the, the problem and we should have been able to anticipate that some because now we're in these two-year lead times. General Serrano has in fact said he needs 100 uh, helicopters to effectively do his job because even if 80 percent of them are flying, uh, the problem has increased, the, 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 the nature of the problem has increased and that the interim solution that we worked out is, as we've heard, those the Bell helicopters, and qu quite frankly, we had some discussion that they weren't in the greatest shape, but they were in terrible shape, uh, and and that uh, it cost extra funds. And I do want to say for the record, too, as, as we've discussed this uh, a number of times, some of the decisions in the alterations were from General Serrano. Uh, some of the decisions were, in my opinion, the fault at, at our end certain basic things were not in the helicopters that would have been expected to be there. Other things we were arguing about by changing, we wanted, as some people said, the Cadillac version of the guns. There were questions about the, the price of the bullets in relationship to those guns and, and a number of things. But some of the helicopters didn't even come with basic things. Uh, and that the delays, uh, implication here was is that part, a significant part of the delays were coming because of modifications from the Colombian National Police. And I just I, I believe some may have been, but even those were because of, of policy debates here as well and, and things that would, you would normally expect to have in it. So they were not unreasonable demands, for example, to have a gun or a gun holder or a mach machine gun holder. I mean, there were, there were some things that the Columbia National Police were coming back with that weren't um, kind of extras. They weren't like electric windows or something. They were kind of basic things in helicopters that, in my opinion, we should have had going down. Because I wanted to clarify, because it sounded like they were just being overly picky, as opposed to uh, we, in effect, sent them some shells, in, almost in some of these cases. Sir, if I gave the impression that there was one particular area that was the primary area of responsibility for the delay, uh, I did not mean to do that, and I'm not prepared to assign responsibility 
first responsibility here, there, or elsewhere. I was simply trying to give the committee a sense of the variety of issues that caused this. First, let me say, with respect to the issue of the first two which arrived down there, they did not arrive down there without the knowledge of the Colombian National Police of what they were coming with. When they got down there and they saw what they had, they had some desires to make some changes. That's understandable. This was the first time that they had received this. So what we did was to try to make those changes to those helicopters and to make sure that the subsequent helicopters ask, also had those changes on them. ask you a specific question related to that specific point. <clears throat> that um, partly that was an agreement for those helicopters that, that we struck. It was not originally the request of the... Oh, are and, you talking about the Bell 212, sir, or are you yes. talking about the Huey 2s? Well, the, well, both of those were neither their okay. choice. In other words, right. first we did the upgrade of the Huey 2s, and, and then we did the Bells, because the Blackhawks have been delayed for such a long period of time. But in those different cases, why wouldn't you have talked to the CNP f first about that, or more informed them, because in effect, they were new in this area. In other words, here's what you said that... that um, uh, once they got them, they wanted not unreasonable modifications, but why wouldn't that discussion have occurred at the front we end? We did have that discussion beforehand, sir, You're and what I'm saying is when they saw them compared to other helicopters, they had some changes that they thought they wanted to have made, and that's what we tried to do, was to make those changes so that they would be available for them. Uh, I, I, it wasn't, there was nothing that was withheld from them. That, these are discussions that we have with them on a regular basis about what it is that we purchase and provide for them. We don't just give them things that we think that they need without talking with them. Yeah, I just, I, I, and I realize the chairman's been very generous. I, I just like to say that part of this, I think, is is that um, they are, in this case, the uh, they are adjusting as best they can to get the best resources they can from us, and then, uh, but it is not because they say we would like this upgraded or compared to. They get new helicopters and say, hey, we'd, we thought we would like these to be like the other INL head. That does not mean that they're holding up the process. It means that uh, to some degree they're having to take what they can and then seek out upgrades from us. And we need to continue to work through that. I'll, I'll yield back. Yes, sir. And that is uh, absolutely our intent as well, to work this as quickly as possible, to get them the equipment as quickly as possible, and to get it to them in the form that they want it in. I thank the uh, gentleman from Indiana, and I'd like to recognize the chairman of the International Relations Committee, also a member of our subcommittee, Mr. Gilman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I can't thank you enough for continuing uh, with this uh, uh, concern on our narcotics strategy and what we can do to help Colombia. I regret I had to leave to go to another meeting, uh, but I'm pleased I was able to get back here for this panel. Secretary Beers, uh, are we now convinced that we're going to try to provide to General Serrano all of the helicopters that he needs? He's talked about if he had 100 helicopters, he could eradicate the whole crop within a two-year period. Are we going to be supportive of that request? Sir, General Serrano has never requested 100 helicopters from me. I will talk to him about that, but I can't say that I've ever heard that. We've certainly talked on a regular basis, including uh, earlier this week with respect to various levels of requests. I have no request for 100 helicopters. It was my impression that his staff had forwarded that information. I have not ever seen that request, sir. I will check with my staff. And but if, I can't if say that, that request aware. comes to you, will you be able to support his request? We will, within the available funds, look at what we can do to fulfill that request. I can't commit to you 100 helicopters because I have to figure out how to pay for them or we have to figure out well, how to pay Well, we'll work with you if you're in agreement that this has to be done and you come back to us with a proposal, I'm sure that a number of the members of this committee particularly will try to be of help to you. Secret I appreciate that, sir. Secretary Beers, uh, a, a total of uh, 38 uh, helicopters had been assigned to Columbia, 23 are in flying status, and 15 are not flying because of um, maintenance problems and lack of parts. Um, uh, just uh, in June of 98, uh, you assured us that any of the helicopters going down there, and I quote you, will not be hangar queens. 
and yet he's got about 15 that are hanger queens right now. Uh, a year and several million dollars later, only two of the six INL provided Bell 212s are flying. Um, can you tell us what we can do to beef that up this situation momentarily without waiting for a whole new a process to go through to get additional flying equipment? Sir, with respect to the six Bell 212s which were provided, uh, the, it is correct that today on the flight line two are available to fly. Of the remaining four, one was crashed uh, not too long ago and has been destroyed. Uh, the other, the second, uh, was uh, the subject of a hard landing by the Colombian National Police, which has caused uh, significant damage to the plane. That plane is currently being repaired uh, by uh, us in, and, and them, and we will put it back on the flight line as soon as it is available. With respect to the other two, one is down for scheduled maintenance, the other one is down for a fuel cell replacement process, which is underway on a priority basis. With respect to the helicopters, other than the one which was crashed and the one which had the hard landing which has had to be taken out of service, that is, with respect to five until just recently and with respect to four now, the operational readiness rate of those helicopters has been at about 65 percent, which exceeds the operational readiness rate of any other element of the Colombian National Police Air Service. So to say that something is a hangar queen by definition means that it never flies. These Bell 212s fly. They don't fly every day, but no plane does. They have to spend some time in maintenance. You, you roughly fly for an hour and maintain uh, something like that for uh, two, three, four, five hours, depending upon the aircraft. So I believe that I delivered helicopters that were flyable and that they have been flyable within the terms of what one would normally expect out of helicopters. Well, Secretary Beers, and I appreciate your response, if that's a normal kind of problem, these maintenance problems, crash uh, equipment, if we, if he has only 23 that are flyable right now, it would seem to me we'd want to add something on an expedient manner to give them more uh, air capability and rather than wait for a whole new project. Can't we move some additional equipment down now? Sir, we will, have, we will talk with the Colombian National Police and see what we can do. Uh, we, we'd welcome that. Uh, yes. Anything we can do to uh, assist them in what they're trying to do I think would be helpful and if we're worried about the massive amount of illicit narcotics coming out of that country, whatever we can do to help them interdict that would be very helpful and to eradicate at the same time. Um, are you going to be making a new budgetary request for the year 2000 and will that be in addition to what we've been, you've asked for this year? Is it going to be an increase? What, it, would, be, what would be your budgetary request for the coming year? for fiscal year 2000. Yes, fiscal With year respect to the discussions which are currently underway, which General McCaffrey spoke of and, and, and others have spoken of, there is a review underway of uh, what the situation in Colombia is like. And as we come to the conclusion uh, of that review, we will be back to inform you of what our views are on that. But at this particular point in time, I can't tell you that there will or will not be a budget request because that hasn't been decided yet, and it's not my position to say anything about that, sir. Yeah. But we will, we will, as General McCaffrey promised to you, be back to you when we have... But what, what, what is your general thinking right now, knowing what the problem is and knowing the inadequacy of what we've been doing up to date? What is your thoughts? Are you thinking about an increase right now or a decrease? Sir, I'm not in liberty to tell you. <laughs> what the deliberations within the well, administration... Well, I'm, I'm asking what your recommendations I, I understand that, sir, and I'm part of an administration and part of a team. I, in my written statement, 
submitted that I think uh, and we all at the State Department believe that the situation in Colombia is a very serious situation and needs a very careful review. Anything that we do in Colombia, and we have heard from a variety of members of the committees about how difficult the choices will be. You have also heard from witnesses about how difficult the choices would be. It would be premature at this point in time for me to tell you what the recommendation could or should be, in part because part of this process is critically dependent upon what the Colombian government is prepared to do and thinks. And while General McCaffrey has had one round of discussions and Under Secretary Pickering will have another round of discussions next week, all of that is part of building the process to the point that we actually have something uh, that we have come to a judgment on and something that we're prepared to do. And at this point in time, Congressman, I'm not in a position to tell you what that ought to be. Well, we'd like to, I would like to recommend, I'm sure my colleagues would like to recommend to you, that we make certain that we provide the kind of resources that are needed down there to accomplish what we're seeking to do, and that's to uh, eradicate the supply and to interdict the supply coming to our nation. Thank you, sir. We appreciate the support that you've given us over the years. And let me thank you, Mr. Beers. And let me uh, re refer now to uh, Mr. Sheridan, uh, Defense Department. Um, as you know, Mr. Sheridan, uh, we helped the Mexican military obtain 70 or more excess Hueys several years ago. We've now been informed that they plan to rid themselves of nearly 50 of these old choppers. Can't we arrange to have some of those choppers that are still operational be upgraded to super Huey status for use by the police in Colombia to fight drugs at a fairly reasonable cost to us since the Mexicans are about to unload those? Um, let me first say that the, uh, regarding the, the helicopters in Mexico, it, it is the case that we are, we are bringing them back. Um, there will be I believe uh, 20 that will remain, but I have to be very clear that, that Department of Defense authorities do not allow us to spend funds for upgrading helicopters and then transferring them to a third party. We're not permitted to do that. What we usually end up doing is working with Randy uh, on those kind of arrangements. So it seems you're pretty close to each other, even at this table. In the <laughs> I would and hope And with that. our discussions about budgets and, and uh, activities and oh, programs. Can, yes, right, sir. But let's talk about the efficiency of this kind of a project. Here you're taking 50 choppers back from Mexico. When will they be back with us? Uh, they will be back soon. How soon? Uh, I th if, if my latest information is correct, the first ones will be moved back by truck imminently, if not already departed Mexico. All right, so some are on their way already. Yeah, could be. What, but, would it, but, what will it take to make them operational for the Colombians? What are we talking about money. per chopper? <laughs> How much would it take to make it, these operational? I think what the first step, and we will, we will have them back in a central facility, the first step will be a very detailed examination, tail number by tail number, to, to Just see. Just approximately, what, what would it take to make one of these operational? Most of them are operational now, as I understand it. I guess now. I, I, but especially to upgrade, it's probably a couple million, isn't it? The upgrade, sir, the kit alone is $1.4 million. For and each it, chopper? For each helicopter, to, to make a Huey II out of it. To make them operational. I'm not uh, talking and, about making a Huey II, I'm just telling right. you. Uh, and, and I'm trying to answer that, sir. What, what, with what with is respect to making them operational, it is entirely dependent upon the review that Brian's people have to make to see what the repairs required are, but the general review that we and they conducted earlier was that they were in pretty bad shape. But what would you estimate? You both are experts. What do you estimate it would cost to make a, a chopper of that nature operational and send it back down to Columbia? I wouldn't even... Three to five hundred thousand a chopper if they're as in bad a shape as they are supposed to be. And how much be. would a new chopper cost? Uh, there isn't a new Huey 1H. The, well, the, the similar. 412 uh, runs on the order of six, six to eight million. All right, so there's a substantial savings between the six to eight million to the three or four hundred thousand of making these operational. Can't we explore the possibility of 
uh, rehabbing these choppers and sending them down to help the Colombians while we're waiting for Black Hawks to be sent down. I'm, I'm going to ask you to explore that and get back to our committee. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, uh, if you would submit a report to our committee with regard to the possibility of utilizing these choppers for the purposes that we're seeking, and that's to upgrade General Serrano's efforts in Colombia. And I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I want to thank uh, you and uh, the other members who've participated with us today. Yes. Also want to thank uh, our panelists. Uh, we uh, called you to testify so that we could work together to solve some of these uh, problems. Uh, there is a level of frustration uh, as a result of not being able to get the equipment to, to Colombia and uh, the resources so that we could assist the Colombians uh, to bring this situation under control. And it certainly is in the vital interest of the United States when we have had last year over 14,000 Americans die uh, from drug-related deaths, uh, and, and that's just uh, part of the number. And, uh, uh, a doubling in the uh, number of heroin uh, overdose deaths. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cummings and I have served together for so long, and he tells me that he has uh, the DEA reports 39,000 heroin addicts in Baltimore. He tells me it's closer to 60,000, which is almost 10 percent of the population, an incredibly staggering amount. And when I go home, uh, I, I'm met by mothers. I have been met by mothers who've lost a child. I come from an affluent uh, area uh, in central uh, Florida, and I've, I'm accosted by mothers who've lost a son or a daughter, uh, and it's very hard for me to respond. And, uh, and some of them have taken uh, heroin, maybe this, this high, pure, deadly heroin one time, and. Uh, dire as a result, so it's affecting everyone, uh, and dramatically the cost is uh, uh, in the billions and billions to this nation. So we're trying to stop drugs at their source. Um, in September, we'll be doing uh, hearings on the southwest border. Uh, we're also anticipating hearings on uh, our uh, drug education program. We funded $195 million. Uh, and we're going to see how that money's been spent. Uh, and we'll also be doing hearings on our substance abuse programs, our grants uh, through HHS, our health uh, uh, grants, and uh, other drug uh, programs. Uh, that will be in September. Do have a request uh, for additional uh, statement to be entered into the record, uh, this one by myself, without objection, so ordered. Uh, without objection, we will also, and with the permission of the minority, leave the record open for additional uh, statements and questions uh, for three weeks. And I might say that we have substantial additional questions. I don't think we've even scratched the surface of them for both the Department of State uh, and Defense uh, on this issue. So they will be submitted and be made part of uh, the record. Uh, there being no further business uh, to come before the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice, Drug Policy, and Human Resources, I declare this meeting adjourned. Yes.
Campaign 2000. As the race for the presidency progresses, join C-SPAN for Road to the White House every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern and Pacific.